We repeat, the flying gimp has been destroyed. You may return to your homes. And welcome back to Pride Resurrection, the historical video series dedicated to the Pride Fighting Championships, where with each episode, we'll take a look back at a specific event from Pride's history. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look back at Pride Fighting Championships number seven. I am the most dangerous man alive today, and joining me is the machine. Say hi, I'm machine. Glad to be here. Unfortunately, the Colombian good vibe, he was supposed to be here, uh, but he forgot and he accidentally scheduled himself late for work. So, he's here in spirit. It's September 12th, 1999 and it's only been two months since Pride number six. And once again, the Yokohama Arena in Yokohama, Japan will host a deluge of male bodily fluids. 10,000 fight fans have turned out for the festivities of punching and kicking. And tonight, we're set to have eight bouts to enjoy with six of those being MMA bouts, one being a grappling match, and one very special pro wrestling bout that wasn't included on the DVD, but okay, more- I didn't see that on there. I'll, I'll get more onto that later. Steven Quadros and Boss Rutten have returned to record their voices over the action, and the DVD version of this event was what we all watched. Pride 7 here was held Similarly to Pride 6, it was held 12 days before a UFC event, which was UFC 22, Only One Can Be Champion, which was an MMA event held in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which would host a main event bout featuring Frank Shamrock, Dirty Rotten Teaser, who last Pride, if you remember, to told everybody he was gonna fight in Pride, and of course we know from that he never would. Uh, he faced off against Tito Ortiz, in a bout which would see Shamrock force Ortiz to submit via punches in the fourth round. UFC 22 would also see the UFC debut of Matt Hughes, who would defeat his opponent Valery Ignatov via three-round decision. Chuck Liddell would also fight at UFC 22. We'll get to see old Chucky in a future Pride event or two. Uh, Chuck would win via TKO in the first round against Paul Jones. And R Ron Waterman would also fight. We'll get to see Ro uh, Waterman at Pride 24. Waterman would earn a draw against Tim Lajic. I guess that's how you say his name. Yeah, got me, I don't remember that one. Before the start of the event, we get another big intro, this time with the theme of war, I guess. Uh, there's sounds of helicopters, jets, and bombs going off. It's kind of strange. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I guess if you consider this a war, maybe it does make sense. Then we're introduced to our four fighters, which isn't exclusive to the main events. We get Kerr, Sakuraba, Ensign Inoue, and someone else. Unfortunately, they cut the footage to not show who the last person is, but I'm assuming that it was Takata. And since Takata wasn't on the DVD, that's why they cut him out of the DVD package. They had Takata show up because he's in a uh, pro wrestling bout. Right. So that's the only thing I can assume here. But for some reason, the editors of the D DVD decided to throw in stock music over the actual intro, and they totally fucked it up. Also, just a note here, Mark Kerr looks like the cutest little full-size kid ever in his polo shirt, his short shorts, and his sneakers. He just looks so cute. Did you want to grab him and give him a little pinch of the cheek? Yeah, he looks like a, he looks like a monster. <laughs> yeah, he looked like the most ridiculous, oversized, overgrown kid ever. Really good at that. And quickly, before we get to the fights, we want to talk a little bit about, unfortunately, good vibe. He's not here to share in his championship uh, we have a new Pride Resurrection Championship belt. I'll post a show a picture of it here. Current champ since Good Vibe beat me last episode at the video games. 
He's the current champ, but since he's not here to defend it, we're going to have to crown an interim champion. That's right. Me versus the machine to see who the Pride Resurrection, Death. the video game interim champion will be. And once Good Vibe returns for Pride 8, he'll have to face the interim champ. Also, a quickly here, arrows and omissions from the last episode. Just some new information has come up. The belt that was put around Ogawa's waist after his victory over Gary Goodridge was in fact the NWA World Heavyweight Belt. This is according to YouTuber Leonardo Zedravic. I, uh, sorry if I butchered that. Z Zedravic. Zedravic. We're gonna go with that. I'm terrible with names. Yeah, I've worked at my job for nine years. They still don't pronounce my name correctly. <laughs> Also, during the Ogawa fight, I, inc I incorrectly said he wrestled for AJPW. That's All Japan Pro Wrestling. Wrong! It was NJPW, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Sort of like the WWF and the WCW. That's AJPW and NJPW. Uh, sorry, folks. I got that wrong. Also wrong! I totally made up all the stats I read during the Kerr Takata fight as I didn't have the stats in front of me and I just said, fuck it, I'm going to outright guess is what they were. Got them completely wrong. Sorry, folks! Also, one last thing here. We totally didn't realize that Musashi, the kickboxer who got kneed by Goodridge, is the same name of the samurai fighter from Time Killers, the game we uh, played back in episode 4. I can't um, remember that. Yeah, Musashi. They remember the sound? Yeah, I played the knight who got his arm cut yeah. off. <laughs> and with all that out of the way, let's get on to the fights! sees a returning Daijiro Matsui, who stands 5'9", was 199 pounds, and was 26 years old at the time. Jughead's MMA record as of this fight was 0, 2, and 1. He's facing off against Bob Schreiber from the Netherlands, who stands 6 foot, was 237 pounds, and was 34 years old at the time. Schreiber's MMA record at this time was 11 and 4. Matsui is back after an entertaining bout against Carlos Newton at Pride 6, and now he'll face off against a dangerous Dutch kickboxer. But just who is this Bob Schreiber fellow anyway? Born in Akmar, Netherlands, I assume that's how it goes, Dirty Bob, as he is known, started training judo and karate in 1981. He then picked up Muay Thai. And after some time, though I'm not sure when, Schreiber would capture the Dutch Muay Thai Championship and then the WKA European Muay Thai Championship. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of information on when he won those championships. On January 1st, 1995, Bob would make his MMA debut at CFT1, that's Cage Fight Tournament, which was held in Belgium. He fought twice at the tournament, losing both times via submission in the first round to rather non-notable opponents who have very hard to pronounce Norwegian names, so I'm not even going to try. Bobo would then head to Japan where in the same year of 95, he would appear at Rings Budokan Hall 1995, knocking out his opponent, Aruzini Luzanov. Schreiber would fight in two more Rings events, occurring in 96 and 97 in Amsterdam, defeating both his opponents in the first round, including a man named Toon Stalling. Not shitting you, Toon 
Stalling. That's a fucking awesome name. <laughs> Schreiber would appear at M1 MFC Global World Championships of 1997 on November 1st of that year, where he'd win a tournament by defeating two unknown Russians with first a submission, then a knockout, both in the first rounds. Schreiber then headed back to Amsterdam on February 8th, 1998, to fight in Rings Holland, King of the Rings. There he faced off against Gilbert Ivel, a fighter mm. we'll get to see later on in this very event. Dirty motherfucker. Schreiber would lose to Ivel via Achilles hold in the second round. Schreiber, though, would have a chance for revenge at IMA KO Power Tournament, held two months later in April of 98, once again in Amsterdam. After a TKO against his first opponent, Glenn Brown, Schreiber faced Ivel in the final bout, knocking old Gilbert out in the first round. Schreiber had successfully won two MMA tournaments. No small feat. Schreiber fought in five more fights after that tournament win, all in different promotions, mostly in the Netherlands, winning four out of five, including another beating of old Toon Stallings, only seven days before Pride number seven here. Official rules displayed at this time around as a graphic on the DVD, but they are all in Japanese, so what are the rules? I have no- I don't speak Japanese. I'm sorry, I don't speak Japanese. I, yeah, I have no idea what the rules are. If anybody listening to this can translate what these words on the screen say, we'd appreciate it if you let us know. And we'll include it in the next episode. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Round number one. The bell rings and Schreiber comes out with a left. Then he attempts to deliver another one. But Matsui drops to the mat and sucks in a leg of Bob and puts him down on the mat. Matsui is in Schreiber's full guard. Dirty Bob delivers some rapid fire rights and is inching closer and closer to the ropes. Soon, his head is through the ropes and he punches Matsui, though the ref comes in to reset the fight out of the ropes. Boss comments on Bob Schreider's previous dirty tactics, earning him the name Dirty Bob. Yeah, with Bob, you can always expect something like a headbutt or a kick in the groin or an elbow when it's not legal. <laughs> he is, um, they call him Dirty Bob. That's his nickname. Bob. More rapid punching from the bottom by Bob. Matsui postures up and delivers some swinging bombs before getting pushed away by Schreiber. Matsui holds onto his ankle, then Bob rotates away and Matsui soccer kicks him in the fucking head! Bob gets to his knees, grabs Matsui's legs, but Matsui sprawls. Matsui rotates to Bob's back before both fighters stand up. Boss comments on Schreiber's appearance, calling him bloated. He can look a little bloated here, but he's a very good striker. <laughs> and that's his friend. <laughs> right. He's like, oh yeah, and, you know, he's saying shit about like he works as a bouncer at this place for right. so long, yeah. Matsui shoots in and easily gets a single leg takedown on Schreiber. Schreiber works Matsui's head while Matsui works Schreiber's body. Matsui postures up and slams down two rights before Babo pushes him away a bit with his feet. Matsui, near the end of Schreiber's knees, is pelted with hammer fists by Schreiber. And during all this, Boz talks about how Schreiber doesn't work on ground fighting at all, since there are no schools teaching it in Holland. What is the ground fighting training regimen for Bob Schreiber consist of? Uh, pretty much nothing because they don't have a lot of schools in Holland. That's at the time, of course. Yeah, they're, they're big in the kickboxing shit over there. They yeah. always had been. Like, some of their best, best fighters are all the kickboxers out of Holland. At this time, according to Boss, all they felt they needed to train was stand-up. So yeah. there's no reason to have ground uh, training schools or wrestling at all, which Obviously, now I, you would assume that's very, very different. Matsui manages to get back into full guard, and both fighters exchange small punches. Matsui postures up again and grabs Schreiber's leg for an Achilles stretch, but Schreiber sits up and pops Matsui's exposed face with right hands. Matsui switches to a heel hook, so Schreiber lays back, blatantly grabs the ropes for leverage, and shoes Matsui right in the face twice before the ref calmly tells him to stop. And he still has the ropes! Ref, open your fucking eyes and look what he's doing! The ref halts the fight so the fighters can be repositioned, as Quadros and Boss debate the rules and whether those kicks by Schreiber were actually legal. 
On the restart, Matsui continues working for the heel hook, but Schreiber appears to be in no danger. Schreiber rolls out of the heel hook and both men get to their feet as Matsui pressures Schreiber, delivering soft punches. Schreiber then knees Matsui in the bread basket, though with little power, <laughs> and Matsui backs away before shooting in for a takedown where Schreiber delivers a well-timed knee that clocks Matsui, much to Boss Rutan's liking. After a moment on the mat, both men stand and Schreiber chases a retreating Matsui, throwing a high kick at Matsui's head. Matsui desperately dives for a takedown, but an improving sprawl by Schreiber allows Schreiber to get Matsui's back. Schreiber then stands and tries to punt Matsui's head, causing the ref to step in and halt the bout. Apparently, it is illegal to kick the head of a downed opponent when they are facing down on all four limbs. Unsure of whether Schreiber understands Japanese. I'm sorry, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> the ref then demonstrates for him. Gee, thanks ref. <laughs> the fight is restarted. Matsui teases a takedown before rethinking it and then he tries it again, this time committing to the idea and getting Schreiber down onto his ass. Six minutes remain in the first round. Bob pounds away with light punches on Matsui's head. Matsui gets the half guard. Then as Schreiber rolls, Matsui briefly gets his back, then threatens with an armbar to which Schreiber ejects from. Both men then get to their feet. The men exchange rights, then Matsui shoots in for a foot, and although Schreiber grabs both ropes, he ends up falling down to the mat. Another stop and restart by the ref, and Schreiber is breathing pretty hard here. Five minutes left in round one. Yeah, he was, he was huffing and puffing by the end. He clearly... Not, not even the first round, he was huffing and puffing. Yeah, he clearly has no conditioning whatsoever. No. And he's not in, like, overly muscle shape, so... I don't know what the fuck is going on with him. I think he's just getting old. Matsui gets to mount, and Schreiber rolls as Matsui grabs his left arm, ending up on the bottom as Schreiber is now standing. Schreiber stalks over Matsui, who backs away using the old butt scoop technique. But then he stands after a moment. Matsui asks for time out as his left glove is fucked. Before the ref calls to restart the fight, and while he is clearly still checking Matsui's glove, Schreiber decides it would be a good time to punch Matsui. Schreiber must have been confused on what was actually happening. Matsui becomes very upset by this and gets right into Schreiber's face, as Matsui must not have known that he's actually in a fight and someone punching him in a fight is an insult, I guess. Of course, Schreiber was in the complete wrong here. How could he not realize that right. the rep is right there checking his fucking glove? And he comes out. Right, right, they're in cahoots and shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're in cahoots against him. Uh, but Matsui's anger here is also pretty funny. He gets like really upset, like, oh, how dare you punch me? Oh, yeah, he was pissed. Also, Schreiber gets another yellow card. Haas comments on this as why this is why he's called Dirty Bob. He uh, is a bouncer at the uh, famous Bulldog. What did he do? He, he hit him before the referee restarted the fighters. He gave him a clean shot before the referee let them resume the action. Another cheap shot by Bob Shriver. There we go, the name. Name Dirty Bob is the nickname. It's here on my paper. The fight finally restarts and the fighters meet in the center of the ring with Schreiber delivering a left and right. He tries it again but Matsui smartly ducks and hits Schreiber with his own one-two. Matsui shoots in again but good sprawl by Schreiber. Schreiber delivers an elbow to Matsui's shoulder. Quadros asks Boss to guess on how many street fights Bob Schreiber has had. Just to guesstimate, Boss Rutten, how many Street fights, do you think that uh, Bob Schreiber's had? Oh, it, <laughs> a couple of hundred at least. 500 street fights, and you can consider yourself a legitimate tough guy. The fight is halted once again to get the fighters out of the ropes. On the restart, Schreiber stands up and unabatedly punches Matsui's head several times. Matsui grabs his leg, and Schreiber delivers hammer fists. Matsui pushes forward, and as they hit the ropes, Matsui whips Schreiber down and out of the fucking ring! 
Go get him. Oh! <laughs> Very impish. Schreiber, with no control, straight up falls right on his head to the outside. Though he didn't really land that hard. That was glorious. <laughs> he like is like oh, he lip, just, yeah he slid out. It was it was yeah. great. Lip fish. He just falls like no control. Like not not doesn't put his arms out <laughs> to stop himself. He just falls. He just goes like a turd coming out of an ass. <laughs> The crowd seems to appreciate this turn of events as they cheer and applaud. Schreiber landing almost in the lap of one of our judges. But I get the funny. Bob's wife is apparently right here. And early in the fight, Boss commented on how she herself is a Valley Tudo fighter. Quadros for his part, calls her a very nice lady. Schreiber is back into the ring and the fight is restarted. Nice check by Schreiber as Matsui tries to kick his legs. Matsui shoots in and manages to swing Schreiber down to the mat. Three minutes remain in round one. Matsui gets too aggressive and Schreiber manages to push him off with his feet. And as Schreiber tries to get up, Matsui flies back in with a knee, tackling Schreiber down to the mat. Matsui is back in full guard. Something happens that causes the crowd to laugh and then applaud. You know, in, in a way, you don't really want to, you don't want to give your opponent a reason to want to beat you. What was it? We may never know. Matsui backs away and as Schreiber is distracted by the ref telling him not to hold the ropes, Matsui leaps in for a double stomp that lands flush on Schreiber's chest. You can hear Schreiber groan. Matsui mounts on top of Schreiber then, from the side, and wails on Schreiber's head. Schreiber gets to his knees and Matsui takes his back, but Schreiber stands and heads towards the corner. Schreiber turns and faces Matsui. Schreiber talks to his corner and Matsui stomps on Bob's toes. Yeah, it's like, well, it's like, guess what, motherfucker? One shoe is gonna, you're gonna have a hard time putting your foot in that shoe. <laughs> yeah, that's right, he's gonna have one swollen foot. Right. <laughs> Schreiber tries to respond with a knee. The ref steps in and separates the fighters. On the restart, Schreiber rushes in with a knee. With one minute left, Matsui dives in for an ankle and Schreiber hops around on one leg before Matsui winds up with his head right between Schreiber's legs. Schreiber sprawls and lays on top of Matsui. Matsui lets go to which Schreiber stands. Matsui is still on the mat and Schreiber stalks over him. Schreiber tries an axe kick before Matsui grabs Schreiber's other foot. The fighters are all entangled here in the corner. Matsui manages to secure a heel hook, though Quadros warns that it's too high up, meaning that some of Schreiber's toes are too close to being outside of Matsui's armpit, and he's right. Schreiber frees himself, and with a netherlander grunt, he punches Matsui. Then Schreiber stands and delivers another good right hand, then another, and Matsui appears to be busted up. Schreiber continues to deliver good shots, but also continues to keep grabbing the ropes for leverage. The ref slaps his hand, and then Matsui manages to roll over onto all fours. Just as the bell rings. But Schreiber isn't done with Matsui yet, as after the bell has rung, he lands an axe kick right to the back of Matsui's undefended head. Schreiber grabbing the ropes. Schreiber, oh no! Schreiber throwing an axe kick to the back of Matsui's head when he was down on all fours. The ref tries to rough up Schreiber over yeah, that this. That was ridiculous, honestly. I thought that was it was, it was, yeah, it was terrible. He shouldn't have done that shit. And then the ref coming over, like, what's he going to do about it? Right. The, the ref comes over, starts beating the shit out of Schreiber. Right, slapping him and pushing him and shit. <laughs> Matsui simultaneously holds the back of his head and his mouth, maybe because the force of the blow caused his teeth or jaw to impact into the mat. And it's during this confusion that the ref calls for a stop to the fight. Schreiber has been disqualified. Matsui eventually emerges from the mat, and then he goes right for Schreiber. The ref steps between them, and J uh, Matsui shouts Japanese words at a man who has no clue what the fuck he is saying. Kara rari temperatin. Sankonbanwa. Hut! 
I'm sorry, I don't speak Japanese. Schreiber, for his part, is probably thinking of sweet cake at that moment. About a dozen refs pull Matsui away. That's an embellishment. And Matsui continues to air out his anger. Hold me back, he said. Just hold me back. Right. <laughs> Then Matsui has his arm raised, he shouts victoriously, and that is it for our fight. What were your thoughts on this one? It was a very obvious disqualification. I thought, yeah, it just it should have been stopped then. I mean, they still wanted to go. Maybe they could have let him go, but they already yellow carded him. Yeah, twice, I think. I, I don't think I mentioned the first time. Constant, yeah, constant grabbing of the ropes. He's just a, he's a dirty fighter who, who couldn't get the better of the guy who thought he was going to roll a steamroll, and right if this and was, he got frustrated. If this was like UFC 1 through 5 before they started adding in rules, he might have been fucking fantastic. But oh, here, right. like where there's rules, you can't do stuff, I just don't think he really fucking cared. Uh, I thought it was fun while it lasted. It was a good round. I liked the action. I just know that there is no way Schreiber could have gone another 10 minutes in round 2. And maybe just... Maybe. This was a devious way for Schreiber to get out of the fight easily while still maintaining his face. You know, I'll get disqualified, I don't lose, I don't get a disqualified. Yeah, looking hard ass. He's yeah. already nicknamed Dirty Bob, what you know what I mean? That's right, you're gonna draw a lot of heat and surely they'll bring you back for being a villain. Look what it did for Bronco Sigatic, you know, right. who fights later on in this event. So, what would become of our two fierce fighting baddies here? Matsui would be back in short order for Pride number 8, which takes place a little over two months later in November of 99, where he'll, he'll face off against Vanderlei Silva. Should be a good fight. As for Dirty Bob, he too would draw Vanderlei Silva in his next trip to Pride, but that wouldn't be until the opening round of the Pride Grand Prix of 2000, which we'll get to see in about two so events. He does come back. He does come back, yeah. Between then and Pride 7 here, old Bob would head to Aruba, fighting at the World Valley Tudo Championships number nine, less than two weeks after his appearance at Pride 7 here. He would fight three times that night, including a bout against future Pride star Heath Herring. Mm. After that, he would fight twice more in Amsterdam, but, to learn more about those outings, you'll have to tune in to Pride Resurrection Episode 9. See you then, Pabo! Our second fight of the evening sees a returning Carl Malenko, who stands 5'11", was 100... In 98 pounds and was 29 years old at the time. Malenko's MMA record at this time was 1-1. One one. He's facing off against Vanderlei Silva from Brazil, who stands 5'11", was 199 pounds, and was only a mere 23 years old at the time. Silva's MMA record as of this fight was 8-2. Malenko returns after an upset against the bald Inoue brother, but he gets a very tough challenge and the Brazilian newcomer known as the Axe Murderer. One of the best nicknames in ever. all of MMA ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. It's great. It is great. awesome. It's one of the best in the biz. But just who is this Vanderlei Silva fellow anyway? Born in Curitiba, Brazil, Vanderlei began Muay Thai and kickboxing training at the age of 13 at the infamous Shootbox Academy in Curitiba. He would also pick up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in his late teens. Vanderlei burst onto the pro MMA scene in 1996, where on November 1st, he debuted at BVF No. 6, that's Brazilian Valley Tudo Fighting, a bare-knuckle brawling event. He would knock out his opponent, Dilson Filho, at 3 minutes and 35 seconds of the first round. He would fight again in the BVF for BVF number 10 on July 1st, 1997, defeating Marcelio Barbosi via KO in only 20 seconds. Then it was on to the IVC, where he'd appear at IVC number 2, a question of pride, fighting three opponents in one night, and only losing his last bout via doctor stoppage. Then it was on to IVC number 6, The Challenge, where he would knock out Mike Van Arsdale via soccer kick at four minutes in the first round. Van Arsdale is pretty good. 
I had never seen him fight. Then the UFC came to town with UFC Brazil, where the axe murderer faced a likewise young rising star in Brazil in Vitor Belfort. And in stunning fashion, Belfort would pummel Vanderlei in a TKO victory. It was a savage ass kicking. It was a savage ass kicking. And I have to include a clip in this, regardless if UFC tries to flag the video. Vanderlei returned to the IVC in early 1999 for IVC 9 Revenge, knocking out Adrian Serrano via soccer kick at only 22 seconds of the first round. Then, IVC number 10, World Class Champions in April of 99, where it took only 32 seconds for Vanderlei to win the IVC light heavyweight belt via TKO. UFC came calling once again, and Vanderlei headed to Alabama, USA to fight at UFC 20, which took place on May 7th of 99. His opponent there, Tony Patera, who would succumb to knees from Silva in the first round. And that brings us here to pride number seven. Since he began professional MMA, Vanderlei has never had a need to go beyond the first round. He has either knocked out all of his opponents, or in the case of Maurice Smith, been knocked out in the first round. No submissions, no decisions, just pure fucking rage. Here's hoping he continues it for this fight. Pre-fight, Quadra says there is no way that Malenko can stand up with Silva and he has to take him down. Malenko is gonna have to take Vanderlei Silva down here. There's no way he can stand up with Vanderlei Silva, no way. To quote Michael Cole here, Vintage Silva! He's rolling his wrist, getting them loose for the fight. Classic Silva, he does it in all his fights in Pride, I love it. Quadros details Silva's Valetudo pedigree and calls him a Terminator. Round one, Malenko stalks Silva down and then shoots low for a takedown. They hit the ropes and Malenko has Silva onto the mat. Silva with light punches and Malenko tries to pass before being swept by Silva. Very nice. Silva is in half guard, but then he gets to full guard. Light head and body work by Silva. Dead silence in the crowd, wow. About after a minute, Malenko manages to sit up and then stand, but Silva trips him down with a hand, and now Silva hunches over Malenko in a forward position. As Malenko begins to stand up, Silva pops him with a good knee. Then again, and Malenko shoots down, getting Silva down onto the mat. The ref halts the fight to move the fighters away from the ropes. Malenko is in Silva's guard. Nice right by Malenko. Three minutes are down in round one. Frequent punches by Silva from the bottom. Not a whole lot of output by Malenko, who is simply laying and praying. More punches from the bottom by Silva at the four minute mark. Boss comments on the effectiveness of Silva's punches, claiming that they don't take a whole lot of energy and he can just keep throwing him over and over again. And that's what I say, you can, you can keep punching. What um, Vendelay does right now, it doesn't cost you a lot of energy. Five minutes down now and we're still here in the same position with the same motions. Light work by Silva and not much work being done by Milenko. Then Silva starts to heat up, putting a little bit more anger and pep on his punches. Milenko has risen from his knees to his feet and Silva pushes him away, managing to stand up in the process. Milenko shoots in, but Silva sprawls for a moment, grabs Milenko's neck, then Milenko powers him down. Silva though, still with the neck, as he has a no arm guillotine in, but Milenko manages to pop his head out. Silva with very deep breaths. Malenko suddenly falls back, maybe for a leg lock, but Silva easily sits up and gets on top before Malenko gets to his knees. Silva with backside control, as noted by Quadros, and Silva has Malenko's right arm trapped. Hammer fist by Silva. Silva teases taking Malenko's back full on, but decides against it at the very last second. Sweat drips off of Silva onto Malenko's back. Three minutes left in round one. Big knee to the body by Silva. Silva ejects from his position and stands as Malenko quickly follows him. 
Left head kick by Silva that misses. Malenko goes for a takedown, but Silva stops him in his tracks. Of course he goes for a takedown. Tie clinch by Silva, followed by knees. Two good knees land, then a partially blocked third knee as Malenko pushes Silva back into the corner. Another knee by Silva, then another. Malenko searches for a leg, getting it and trapping Silva in the corner. Two minutes left in round one. Slapping hammer fists by Silva as Malenko is resigned to trying to complete this takedown here. Glimpses of a booger in Silva's nostril. Just, just an <laughs> FYI, fans. One minute left now, and we're still here. Silva has caught his breath and now turns up the pace once again, smacking Malenko's head. He's warned to watch the back of the head, though. Malenko has given up on the right leg, and now Silva is free. Silva goes for Malenko's back and tries to get his legs into Malenko's body, and then he does. He flattens Malenko out, goes for a rear naked choke, but Silva appears too high on the back. Silva gives it up, then punches Malenko from under his armpit. And then the bell rings, signaling the end of round one. What a debut, huh, huh? What a debut, huh? Claims boss. <laughs> I can't do a very good boss <laughs> right. impression, but that's what he he's says. A he's a fucking character. I love him. <laughs> Looks kind of cute, then, says Boss, in reference to Karo Malenko's new hat. Some nice shots of a skinny Japanese ring girl. Or, they better be Japanese. Quadros with some advice to anyone who is stuck in the tight clinch. Like all the girls. <laughs> if you're stuck in the tight clinch, block with your elbows pointed toward the attacker's thighs. Or, just duct tape some knives to your forearms and make sure they are pointed downwards. What tax? Were those things you used to hold corn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Round two! As the men have a standoff, I must ask the question, who wears the little tight shorts better, Malenko or Vanderlei? Head kick by Vanderlei. Vanderlei charges in with a one-two. Malenko grapples, puts Silva in the corner, and then gets him down for just a moment. But Silva gets back up, then nice knee by him, Malenko collapses, and now Silva is on top in backside control with Malenko's left arm once again trapped. Casual no-look hammer fists by Silva. Malenko fights to turn and twist Silva down to the mat, and with a burst of energy, he succeeds. The ref halts the fight to move our fighters. Malenko is in full guard. Is this the one that had like fucking like four refs trying to like pull and like spinning him around? Because there was one of them that was just like it was completely ridiculous. Like. <laughs> they always bring in like sometimes more than one rep. They have to right. get them all in. <laughs> hey, they need like, two guys over here, two guys over here. Slow work by Malenko. He tries a soft right punch. Light punching by Silva. Malenko with another semi good right hand. Sadly, if this is all Malenko is going to muster, he's not going to win at anything. Finally, Malenko breaks his silence, quips Quadros. Quadros with a bit of a stretch right after. Malenko has been reduced to survival mode. Yes. Yes. Finally, M yes, Malenko yes. breaks his silence and throws a right hand. Vandalay Silva with an onslaught of punches from the bottom, basically reducing Malenko to a survival mode at this point. That's a little exaggerated. He's had top control the whole fight, pretty much, yeah. except for the few times, like, you know, when he got the tight clinch, he struck on the knees, he took him back down. Yeah, he's had control the whole fight. I don't think you could say Malenko's in survival. I wouldn't mode. say that, no. <laughs> Four minutes down in round one, and I'm hoping, praying for the ref to stand him up. More light punches by Silva. Lord, I hope this gets stood up. And I hope Vanderlei kills this motherfucker. Not much action to write about. Silva keeps punching, teases a sweep, and Malenko just sort of lays on top of him. Some short hammers by Malenko. Malenko decides to try a leg lock again and ends up getting swept by Silva. Whoops! Was that a move he's been training to do? If so, it's not looking good. Silva is in mount! Three minutes remain in round two, but Silva is playing very cautiously. Malenko tries to push Silva off him, but Silva has very good balance. Malenko tries it again, but achieves nothing except for a few lumps from Silva. Some good shots by Silva, but unless he postures up, he's not going to do a whole lot of damage. I think we're seeing a new mutant, as stated by Quadros. 
I think we're seeing a new mutant in the mixed martial art field. Now, now, Quadros. He might be from Brazil, but no reason to call him a mutant. You know, it'd be great like when you talk about that mutant shit. It's like, what you don't know, fans at home, is that Vandalay Silva is like Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> and he like to like, picture from like the his forehead, like the, oh, like, the, yeah. the like the rings going out, yeah. like you know, like dolphins are flipping and shit. <laughs> They're in Japan, there's a lot of what, you know. I can find a, a, a gif of that. <laughs> Malenko rolls and gives up his back. Silva stretches him out. Only one minute remains in round two, though. Silva works for a choke, but again, he's too high. He gets off of Malenko's back and takes his side. Some knees by Silva. Malenko moves. Silva switches positions several times. And then with five seconds left, Malenko rolls and manages to get back on top. But the round ends here with no finish. Silva pops right up after the end of the round and does a jig. Classic Vanderlei here. Boss hilariously tries to make a reference about Silva's little dance here, saying that Silva for sure saw Saturday Night Um uh, uh, Night Fever. One thing for sure. Here is Vanderlei Silva doing his Y Crew ceremonial dance. I think. Um I think he won that movie, and he for sure he saw Saturday Night of a, a Night Fever. That's one thing for sure. Ah, oh, right. Ah, uh, right, says Quadros. And now we go to the judges. Okay, there it is, boss. Vanderlei Silva, welcome to the Pride Fighting Championships. No surprise here, Silva is declared the winner via unanimous decision. After the decision, Vanderlei's trainer gets in the ring, takes his shirt off, and Silva throws the shirt into the crowd. <laughs> is that supposed to be a souvenir? Right. Yeah, why would you want his trainer's shirt? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the two fun boys then pose together for cameraman. Number one, says the trainer. Good stuff. Hey, fun boys, get the room. <laughs> So, what'd you think of this fight? A uh, good fight from Malenko, because he was expected to get his ass kicked real quick. Well, yeah, when you put it that way. I didn't think of that. Actually, I didn't He was think expected of that. to lose badly. Yes, he was expected to get murdered. Right. And it's the axe murderer shit. So, a good fight from Malenko. Not uh, great for Silva. Um, not showing off what he can really do against... Well, the guy just basically fatted him down. Right. Right, yeah, that's what I have jotted down here. Uh, this debut for Silva, his first fight in Pride, it was a bit deflating. But, you know, he's young, and Malenko is is a good wrestler. Yeah, that's what I said. Good fight for Malenko. I mean, he lost it, but, I mean, it really wasn't, like, bad. He didn't really take a lot of damage. No, no. I think uh, Malenko could have been a very good fighter if he would have maybe got a little bit more striking training uh, done. Right, it's, it's early in the game, right the evolution of the sport. Uh, so yeah, not a great debut for Silva, but bigger and better things lie ahead. So what would become of our two tight, short, wearing dudes here? Both men would return for Pride number eight with Vanderlei facing off against the aforementioned Daijiro Matsui. Good matchup and should be a good fight. Karl Malenko, meanwhile, will face off against a returning Alan Goas. Really? Eh, I don't know. That's the lay in the ground, kicking and screaming guy, right? Uh, no, this was... Uh, no, the... Goez is the guy who was like, he was doing this. Yeah, he was right. doing the baby kicks against Sakuraba. And <laughs> it, it just lay there? Yeah. Like, right, yes. kicking and screaming. <laughs> Good memory, that, that was the reference. He looked like a little baby, yeah. <laughs> A little child having a tantrum, yes. I, I don't know what to think about that fight. It might be good. We'll, uh, we'll, well I, I expect it to be terrible. <laughs> our third fight of the evening is our grappling bout. Featuring a returning Ensign Inoue, who stands 5'10", was 210 pounds, and was 32 years old at the time. He's grappling against Tully Kaluhapai from Tonga who stands 6'2", weighed 248 pounds, and um, I have no idea how old Tully is. I couldn't find any, and I mean this, I couldn't find not one single shred of evidence on who this guy was. Nada, not Zippo, Zilch. In Japan, they may have created him and just put like face paint on him and shit. So this is the call to anybody out there. If you know anything about Tully, 
please leave a comment. Let us know. I'll include it in the next episode. Seriously, the only information I could find on Tully here was the fact that, yes, he really did fight here at Pride number 7. He even contacted John Walsh. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> yes. We'll keep this one brief since it's only a grappling match and spoilers, it's not a very long fight. Tully Kali Hapai, says the announcer. Tully Kali Hapai. Tully Hapai. Ensign is wearing the full gi, it looks really cool, and then holy fucking close up! The cameraman gets right up into- Right up in there. Right up in Ensign's face. <laughs> Apparently Boss and Quadros are not aware this is a straight up grappling match, as even after the fight starts, they are surprised that Ensign is still wearing the gi. They're like, he's gonna wear the gi? I guess he's gonna fight in a gi. Like, is it gonna be hot? <laughs> right. Once again, producers, this is key information that you should hand off to your commentator so they know what the fuck is going on. Quadros also comments on all of the flair, the pieces of flair, <laughs> covering Ensign's gi. Well, Ensign and Owe wear the gi. Now, I know a lot of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters have a lot of patches and decals on their, on their gi. I think Ensign's got a beat in this one. We need to talk about your flair. Really? I, I have 15 pieces on. I uh, well, well, okay, 15 is the minimum, okay? Oh, okay. Now, you know, it's up to you whether or not you want to just do the bare minimum, or, uh, well, like Brian, for example, has 37 pieces of flair on today, okay? Mm. A terrific smile. Okay, so you, you want me to wear more? <laughs> Look, Joanna. Yeah. People can get a cheeseburger anywhere, okay? They come to tchotchkes for the atmosphere and the attitude. Okay, that's what the flair's about. It's about fun. Yeah. Round one! Tully kind of slaps at Ensign, and Ensign gets in on Tully in a grapple. The men go to the ground, and Ensign nearly gets Tully's back. Ensign pulls guard and easily sweeps Tully. Ensign is in full guard. Ensign starts to unwrap his gi, getting it ready for a gi choke. And T Tully, for his part, is merely turtling and guarding. Tully tries to push Ensign off him, and Ensign simply grabs his arm, and just like that, Tully Kali Hapai, wherever the fuck you say his name, has been dispatched with an armbar at 1 minute and 15 seconds of the first round. After the fight, Quadros brings up the fact that Ensign has been given two obviously soft opponents. But this has been two relatively easy opponents for Ensign. Now we know we've, he's beaten Randy Couture, and he's been in the ring with Frank Shamrock and Igor Zinoviev, but we want to see him get back in the ring with a, another really formidable opponent. And he brings up a good point. I wouldn't call Ensign's two fights here in Pride fixed, but they might as well have been given, just handed to him. They were like, soft with a wet baby's Just ass. like, here's, here's <laughs> your wins because he's had two pieces of shit in a row. First, that being- And they might be good people. They might like, you know, take <laughs> right, your own okay. They don't call pieces of shit. Not pieces of shit. Lumps of shit. All right, lumps. All right, I can deal with lumps. Lumps of shit. The first one being Soichi, the monster Nishida uh, at Pride 5, and now this motherfucker from Tonga. Where the fuck is Tonga anyway? Is it a real place? <sighs> anyway, what would become of our two man grappling grapplers here? I have no idea what happened to Tully, unfortunately. He might be dead, he might be alive, only God knows. As for Ensign, he wouldn't return to Pride until the 2000 Grand Prix opening round, where he will face the number one heavyweight in the world at the time, Mark Kerr. I thought it'd be good for him. No. See you then, Ensign.
Our fourth bout of the evening features a returning Bronco Sikatic, who stands 6'2", was 216 pounds at the time, and was 44 years old at the time. Bronco's MMA record was 0-1. He's facing off against newcomer Maurice Smith from the good old USA, who stands 6'2", was 220 pounds, and was 38 years old at the time. Maurice's MMA record as of this fight was eight wins and nine losses. He's back! The return of the villain Bronco. Awesome promo package for the bad man. He's a month shy of his 45th birthday and the Croatian Tiger is looking pretty fucking good. Before his appearance here, Bronco wasn't up to much at all, except fucking hookers. But what about this fellow Maurice Smith? Just a warning here, listeners, uh, this his history is going to be a bit long. Born in Seattle, Washington, Maurice Smith took up karate after being inspired by a Bruce Lee movie. And also playing in a garage band. <laughs> when he was 18 years old, Maurice ventured into kickboxing, and he quickly defeated seven amateur opponents. He would turn pro in 1982, and his first pro fight would be against the World Kickboxing Council's light heavyweight champion at the time, Tony Morelli. Morelli would defeat Smith by decision after seven rounds. But Smith would have his revenge. He would return to fight Morelli 14 months later, this time knocking Morelli out in the seventh round via roundhouse kick to the head. Sweet. Smith was then the World Kickboxing Council's light heavyweight champion. Smith would continue to fight in kickboxing until a brief hiatus beginning in 1993, having amassed a record of 30 wins and 4 losses up until that time. What caused his hiatus? It was due to a venture into Pancrase. This is what requires a bit of backstory. In the late 1980s, the UWF, that's Universal Wrestling Federation of Japan, would hold a series of partially real hybrid fighting events that would showcase unique stylistic matchup bouts, such as kickboxer with gloves versus a bare-handed karate fighter, or a grappler versus a boxer. On November 29th, 1998, UVF would hold the U Cosmos event, where Maurice Smith would be matched up against Minoru Suzuki, who's the future co-founder of Pancrase at the time. In that bout, Smith was equipped with boxing gloves while Suzuki was fighting as a pro wrestler. This fight, which may or may not have been a work, would see Suzuki attempt to suplex Smith over the top rope. In the end, Smith would knock Suzuki out in the fourth round with a curiously soft straight right hand. Regardless of its authenticity, this event is one of the coolest spectacles in the history of MMA, and it's totally worth a watch. If you're out there, uh, I have a copy of it, so if you want to check yeah, it out, I will actually I'll give check you a copy. It out. But if you're listening to this, look for the U Cosmos event. Uh, it is really cool. Uh, I'll include some clips here. The way you said, like, he's equipped with boxing gloves, you could say that the other guy didn't give him a grass skirt <laughs> or, like, he's got a wooden leg. <laughs> Like he, had, he had boxing gloves on. They gave the other guy a fucking colonial tricorder hat. <laughs> you know, maybe one day we can actually watch that one as like and do a side episode. Sure. Not like a part of the main episodes, but as a side episode. You know? Bonus features. Yeah, exactly. And if you read between the lines of what I'm kind of detailing here, you could claim that this UWF event was the inspiration for Suzuki to help in the creation of Pancrase. But I could just be making that shit up. In 1993, Smith would be lured to join Pancrase, and his old pal Suzuki would be waiting for him in his inaugural bout, which would happen at Pancrase. Yes, we are hybrid. Number three, actual name of the event. This time, the bout would be a traditional kickboxing bout with gloves on both men and no grappling, although Suzuki wore the trademark Pancrase leggings. No matter, as Smith would knock Suzuki out again, this time in the third round. His next fight under Pancrase, Smith would fight under the regular Pancrase rules of striking and grappling. This was at Pancrase, Road to the Championship, number one, held on May 31st, 1994. Once again, his opponent was Suzuki. The result? Suzuki would armbar Smith in the third round. 
Smith would stick around Pancrase throughout the mid-90s, losing to Ken Shamrock once and twice to Boss Rutan. He then had two fights in rings of Japan, where he lost both times, once to Shuyoshi Kosaka, TK, Hi, TK, future Pride fighter, and also to Kiyoshi Tamora, another future Pride fighter. Smith then returned to America, appearing at Extreme Fighting Number no. 3 on October 8, 1996. He would head kick TKO Marcus Silvera in the third round. Next, at Extreme Fighting No. 4 on March 28, 1997, in Des Moines, Iowa, dipshit Kazunari Mirakami, remember him from Pride 1? He would get knocked out by Smith in the first round. And special thanks to YouTuber Super Merryman for this awesomely shit video. Then came UFC. At UFC 14, held on July 27th, 1997, Smith would go 21 minutes against Mark Coleman, winning via decision and taking Coleman's heavyweight belt. I watched that fight, too. Yeah, I hear a grueling fight. Yeah, it was. Tank Abbott was next at UFC 15 on October 17th of that same year, where Tank Abbott would simply give up because of his fatness. I mean exhaustion. <laughs> His exhaustion, not fatness. <laughs> it took only eight minutes for that to happen, by the way. Then UFC went to Japan, and Smith would defend his belt against Randy Couture on December 21st. After 21 minutes, the natural would be declared the winner by a decision. Naturally. Naturally. At UFC 19 on March 5th of 1999, Smith would lose via decision to Kevin Randleman. And then at UFC 21 on July 16th of 99, Smith would defeat Marco Huas after Huas's corner called for the fight to stop in between round one and two. Rest in peace, Kevin Randleman, by the way. Rest in peace, Kevin Randleman, yes. And that brings us here to Pride number seven. Maurice is sporting a near-perfect arrow on his chest, which looks awesomely ridiculous. Uh, his hair just... Brian Ebersole style. Not <laughs> yeah. quite that, but yeah. It's pretty close. For naturally growing chest hair... He used some soul glow on that <laughs> shit, though. <laughs> and fuck! Bronco is looking pretty jacked for nearly 45 years old. So I think he's obviously on something here. He looks... For, to be like... To be that age and... And that jacked how, up. Yeah, how he looked... Holy fuck. Well, yeah, they weren't testing for it back then. You can no. just do whatever you want no, to. I... And he's wearing his shorts like an old man to hide Super his belly. <laughs> to hide his belly. <laughs> he talks fast and wears his pants high. <laughs> <laughs> Round one. The fighters meet at the center of the ring and circle. Bronco with a light left kick. Then Maurice misses with his own. They exchange right hands. Maurice moves in and underhooks on Bronco. Bronco tries to fight him off. Surprising Quadros that, that he hasn't been taken down yet. And Maurice going for the trip, but Bronco somehow avoiding the takedown. And then, what the fuck judo hip throw? Where the fuck did Bronco learn that? Bronco is in side control. And Bronco is a guy who's natural strong. Look at this. Now that was beautiful takedown. It was actually pretty surprising when I watched that it too. It was fucking totally surprising. I couldn't fucking believe that actually happened. Bronco's in side control, holding Smith in a headlock. Then an expert reversal by Smith. Wow, it was fucking beautiful. Maurice is now in side control. Knee by Smith. Bronco looks completely out of his element. Another good knee by Smith. Then Bronco powers Smith down to half guard. Boss is commenting on how strong Bronco is. Bronco is just a guy, not just a guy, but very, very strong. Physically, he's very strong. Look at him, he almost threw him off. Muscle in every little piece of his body. With muscle over every piece of his body. Who's that in Smith's corner? Paz and Quadros conveniently forget to mention him, but I won't. That's Shuyoshi Kosaka. He and Smith, along with the Shamrock Brothers, all formed a good friendship in the 90s. Light work by Smith as he looks to set up some type of submission. Bronco decides to try and get up, and now Smith has his back. After a moment, Bronco does stand and gets out of Smith's grasp. Maurice charges in and both men fire an errant strike at each other, with Bronco's punch looking quite lethal. 
Bronco pressures Smith into the corner and fires away, though Smith avoids any damage. Smith then reverses Bronco and now Smith has control in the corner. Slow work by Smith and five minutes have passed in round one. Bronco complains about a headbutt, which had to come from Smith's head positioning. Smith teases a takedown, but Bronco death grips the ropes, then conveniently hooks his arm around it. The ref halts the fight and separates the men. The ref then announces to the judges a warning for holding the ropes. The ref? Yeah, this was ridiculous holding the ropes. <laughs> what do you think? Okay, Bronco Sekicic, his greatest victory was probably Ernesto Hoost in the first K1 finals, right? Yeah. Okay, Maurice Smith, what was his greatest victory? Probably Mark Coleman. Yeah. Well, he's getting a warning for holding the ropes, right? There's a push kick by Smith. Hesitant to right, then a left by Bronco. The men clinch. Bronco, that little scoundrel, is already wrapping his arm behind the ropes, which the ref spots. Smith tries to take Bronco down, and what do you know? He's hooking the fucking ropes. The ref, who seems to already have had enough of Bronco's bullshit, peels off a yellow card for him. I have a note here. Bronco looks fucking ripped here. His shoulders and chest are like a Fucking work of art. Glorious. He's 44 fucking years old, too. Yeah. He shouldn't look like that. No. <laughs> Teasing spinning back kick by Bronco. He charges in with a missing left hook. Smith body locks him, and the crowd erupts in laughter as Bronco hooks the fucking ropes. But then he puts his hands up immediately as if to say, okay. I didn't do it, man. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Fraction. Yeah. Oh, especially for holding the ropes. I mean, if he was doing something like. Uh, now, but the thing is, they've got to be really hard on Bronco Sikatic because the first time he fought in Pride... <laughs> that wasn't me, that was somebody else. Uh, the, the, the crowd laughing at this is what really sells it. Corner fighting, and as Smith pulls Bronco away, that motherfucker holds the ropes the whole fucking time. The outside ref helps Bronco let go, and he immediately grabs it again, getting smacked by both the ref in the ring <laughs> and the ref outside the ring. The crowd laughs again. Almost to the back of the head. So I think they're being extra precautionary in his case, whereas maybe some other fighter, they might just be a little easier. They should put like a high voltage on the ropes. Every time he holds it, they should push a button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might, that might work, actually. I think so. <laughs> Smith has Bronco's back. He moves him to the center of the ring and drags him down to the mat. Side mount by Smith. He grinds his forearm into Bronco's neck, who clearly does not want. All right, Murray Smith into the side mount with Bronco Sikatic. Do you think Maurice is going to work for a key lock here? Yeah, I, I'm pretty much 100% sure because, oh. Three minutes left in round one. Foss jokes that if he heard the sound Bronco made from the forearm and the neck, he would keep doing it. Yeah, it'd be very strange, but if he makes a sound like that from it, if I would be Maurice, I would keep doing it. Boss calls it screaming, but in reality, it was more like groaning. Yeah, he wasn't screaming. Stupid producer, he cuts to a bad angle, and suddenly Bronco moans for some reason due to something Smith is doing, and then he clearly starts tapping. We get a better shot, and we can see Smith has his forearm in Bronco's throat again, and this time it is causing Bronco to squirm. He is actually tapping for real. Although the ref didn't notice it at first, he finally does, he jumps in, Stops the fight and both Quadros and Boss are stunned that Bronco would tap out from this move. I see your point. What happened? He's tapping. Oh, he's tapping out from the forearm or the throat? Wow. Uh, uh, that was really... That really showed a lack of preparation for Bronco Stikicic. That, that is not really even a submission hold that's taught no, anywhere. The, the, the escape for that is look to the side. Maury Smith is thus the winner at 7 minutes and 33 seconds of the first round via forearm choke. What were your thoughts on this fight? I would have liked to rather see Bronco fight the filthy Bob or dirty Bob guy. 
I think it would have been a better match. <laughs> yeah, they could both cheat the whole fucking time. <laughs> Um, uh, Bronco had no chance in this fight. Uh, I think he realized this and took an easy way out there at the end. It was a bitch move, but he clearly gave no shits as to what people thought about him. He isn't that big of a pussy, uh, even though it kind of made him look like a pussy for... Well, they, they are beating very difficult opponents yeah. for being a kickboxer going to Mich MMA. Right, yeah. His first fight being Kerr. I mean, that Bronco versus Kerr. And then your next fight is Maurice Smith. That's right, yeah. Kind of, yeah, it is kind of unfair. So, what would become of our two former kickboxers here? This would be the only pride appearance for Smith, who would go on to fight elsewhere, returning to rings and the UFC, while also fighting in kickboxing. He would have... Notable bouts later in 99 at the tournament events in rings against Brandon Lee Hinkle and Henzo Gracie, a win and a loss. And then he'd have a notable decision loss to Renato Sobro at UFC. Babalu. Babalu at UFC 28 in November of 2000. Smith would semi-retire from MMA in 2000, but he would re-emerge in 2007 to fight Marco Huas, once more in the IFL promotion, that's International Fight League. He would beat Huas, much like his previous fight, via corner stoppage in the fourth round. Maurice Smith won? Yeah. Then yeah. You said IFL? IFL. They don't, like, in the UFC shit, they don't say, like, Ben Rothwell was the IFL champion. They just leave that completely right, right out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Did UFC buy IFL? Or did they I don't know. I think they kind of squeezed him out or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. After that fight, Smith would only fight a few more times until his last fight in 2013 at the ripe old age of 52. A decision loss to some unknown jackass in Kent, Washington in some small unknown regional promotion. A far cry from his glory days. He would end his career with an MMA record at 14 and 14. It's like I'm 5-5-1, five, five and one, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> as for Bronco, this was it for him as well. This is not only his last pride, but it would be his last fight in his career. He decided to live out the rest of his days to what ends we may never know. But I do follow him on Twitter, which he hasn't posted on in years. <laughs> Maybe one day we can get an answer from him as to what happened. Godspeed, boys, and we'll catch you some other time. And that takes us to the halfway point of our amazing event. We technically have three fights left, plus a pro wrestling bout. And so we're going to take a short intermission here because we have to find out who the new Pride Resurrection interim video game champion is going to be. Won't you join us as we go play some video games? Welcome to Intermission. Look who decided to join the fucking party. I heard there was beer and video games. Why the fuck would I not show up? He's come to defend his belt, and he's going to stay for the rest of the show. So we're glad to have him. Hey, you know what? I saw that belt on Twitter. I'm like, I'm not letting that go to anybody. Uh, that look. shit's coming home with me. <laughs> the newly minted, the coveted, the prized Pride Resurrection belt. Okay, so your L button will put in credits. We're playing Tech and Tag Tournament. It's going to be first me versus Machine. Uh, while we, then the winner of this will go on to play. Is it two guys? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you pick two. Then shall you. Oh, God. And then, it's best two out of three. I'll go to Hayashi. What the fuck is he wearing there? A suit, man. Hayashi. Are you not classy enough to know what a suit is? Hayashi? Yeah. Hayashi. Huang. Huang's good. That sounds like Boomerang. Either that or Paul. I'm, just, I'm torn here. Paul. <laughs> you got three seconds, man. Two. Yeah, one. Good. Time. All right, here we go. The tag button, I think, is Z. Okay. Oh, okay. Your kicks are going to be on top, unfortunately. Okay. Oops. Got it. Oh 
Oh, come on, get him, Jack! Shit's not looking good for you. <laughs> well, I better tag out. Okay, there's the one. Okay, oh! Alright. Now, that's been so long since I played, I forget the combos. Flawless victory! <laughs> so far, huh? Ha! Ha! The Ruckin' Pants! That's awesome! We better tag out there. I'm trying to, I don't know which button it is. I think it's the C button. Machine loves woman. <laughs> this is one. This girl I'm actually pretty good with. I'm just doing kick. This is one like sweeping uh, hook kick she does. You can always try button mashing. These are <laughs> for it. What the? Ooh, headbutt. That's oh, illegal. Oh, right. That's illegal, sir. It's against the pride rules. Oh, the machine is getting the use of the controls. It's hard to, but it's a little bit uh, too little too late now. Oh, you can do it. I believe in you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Time up. Time up. All right. Oh, so, it's so far, it's 1 0. 36%. It's now me versus the fucking champion. Yeah. All right. Ah, hit the start button, buddy. I mean, I guess I'll have to stop drinking for a second. Oh, who am I kidding? I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> ah, all right. So this first one, I'm gonna give. I'm gonna let him win. Oh, you're gonna let me win the first one? Yeah, mostly because. Well, I have then no idea. I better. I'm gonna go ultra fucking cheap on you right here, and I'm gonna be. People might be upset with how. I'm cheap gonna go I with am. minorities. <laughs> A robot and. <laughs> A Japanese robot versus your Russian robot. Uh, anybody who plays that Gaty Gordo sucks. <laughs> I'm going for that belt, dude. Oh, I'm Jesus! Gonna... That was not the button I wanted to hit! Holy shit! Holy fuck! How many... <laughs> what buttons are even to hit on this thing? <laughs> Alright, this is not working out for me. One second! How do you... I'm flying it? away! What do you mean? What? Yeah, like... One second. Alright, get, get your controls Let's down, kick. then. I'll let you get... Let's kick. It's left kick, right kick. kick and punch. All right. right punch, left punch. Alright, ready? Apparently so, asshole! Fly away, get him! <laughs> oh, yeah. Alright, I'll get you with this fucking guy, too. He's pretty much the same moveset as Gun Jack. So, so, you want to talk about ultra cheap, I can just do the same guys with the same moves. Plus, then they have uh, Jack 2 as an unlockable character, which, when I load up on the Jacks, I can't be beat. Ow! Whoa, fucking nice. You might get me! You might get me! No! <laughs> no. <laughs> oh god. Alright, here we go. End it right now, Jack! Get him! What are you doing? <laughs> no! I'm All so right. close! Alright, you gotta come back here. <sighs> Hit the start button. I mean, I just don't. Oh, If only I could pick two jacks. Hi, Hachi. I'll get you. Oh, God. Hey, hey, I know how to do that now. Son <laughs> <laughs> of a bitch. See, Jack might be short range, but Hayachi is long range, so. Oh shit. Get him, Jack! Get him! Get that fucker! No! No, goddammit. What the fuck is the beeper? That's the music, I guess. Oh, <laughs> fuck you! Uh, yeah, that's probably Don McLean. He'll, uh, he'll get the idea to come in. 
Alright, better eat. <laughs> That's it. No! Oh, champion! Champion! I'm the new champion! Uh, it was uh, It was rigged! I demand right. a recount! Let's get back to the started. fights. <laughs> Alright, we're back from that fun, but unfortunately, I don't know what we got if we actually recorded it. I'm the champion, though. I am officially the it's champion. It's not recorded, so it's not it's not official. We'll that's, have to that's see. Not, that's how it works. Unfortunately, I think I ran out of space on my drive when I was recording that video. We'll just have to see. But we're back to the fights. Since I wasn't here for the beginning, I just want to point out a couple of things. One, production values for the new DVD are fucking amazing. You know, we get I mean, we get a lot better intro videos. Mm -hmm. We get uh, little bars at the bottom that have their fucking like the weight and height yeah. and shit like that. We actually get told what the fucking rules are. Know, we can't, don't know what they are. <laughs> we we get a fucking timer now. It's like yeah. six minutes till rounds end. Holy shit! Yeah. What? You mean you can't go a half hour and then tell me it's been two minutes? <laughs> yes. What the fuck is wrong with yes, you? Yes, you're right. They are they are improving that, and that takes us to the fourth fight of the evening, which is our. Pro wrestling bout. Uh, now, let me ask you, did either of you gentlemen actually get to see it? I know you didn't, Machine, because it no, wasn't on the DVD. I gave you a link. Oh, oh, that, that link. Oh, my God. How? No, how was that a pro wrestling match? <laughs> no, I don't get it. I watched it. I watched it. I just... There was, okay, maybe I'm just used to American pro wrestling. That's a lot and more that's show. That's Japanese wrestling, and, yeah. yeah pro, that, that one just, just seemed like MMA with less skill. Really, yes. really, yeah. really is what it called out to me. So, well, in the essence of time and for posterity, I'm going to cover this pro wrestling bout, which isn't included on the DVD and is only viewable via other sources. And in our case, that would be YouTube. Hey, yeah, i never seen it. We haven't seen Atsuka since Pride number four. And Takata has decided to further tarnish his run and pride with this pro wrestling bout. Let's get right into it. Round one. Atsuka opens the contest with a wily low drop kick that misses. Takata, unfazed by this, jostles his hips in an effort to entice a somewhat intrigued Atsuka. Takata with a low kick, then front kick that Atsuka nearly catches. High kick by Takata. Atsuka crawls on the mat and Takata tries to kick the shit out of his face. Atsuka faints in and gets a hold of Takata. The combatants fight for arm position. After Takata knees, Atsuka slides around his back, hooks one of Takata's legs, and seems to be going for an abdominal stretch or maybe something else, maybe a signature move. Whatever the case is, the Japanese announcers and crowd get excited until Takata escapes. まあ、アレクセンスでは本当に願ってもないチャンスですからね。そうですね。え、オートンさん、オーマン、なんと、こんなチーズ、こんなチーズ。アスカ。ボーイングスタレは。アントニオ・ヨシタンも、ボー、シ
Now Asuka is in full guard. Light punches by both men. Asuka beans Takata's ass. Asuka then steps up for an inverted Achilles stretch, but Takata reverses him and gets on top. Takata is now in a forward headlock. And I guess the bell rings, as now suddenly the video I'm watching takes us ahead to the start of round two. Flying double kick by Asuka. Spinning jumping back kick by Takata. Both miss. Low kick by Takata, then a high kick, then pummels by Takata. Takata tries a knee as they fight for position. Body kick by Takata, very soft low kick by Atsuka. Standing front guillotine choke attempt by Takata. Atsuka mistakenly tries to lift Takata, and he inadvertently hoists Takata up, allowing Takata to wrap his legs around Atsuka. Atsuka looks to be in trouble. Get out of there, Atsuka! Asuka falls, Takata shouts for Kai energy, and then Asuka pops his head out. Whew! That one was close. The crowd absolutely eats this up. <laughs> Asuka postures up maybe for a leg lock or a heel hook and Takata brushes Asuka's face with an up kick. Asuka spins wildly and face plants onto the mat. Takata calmly gets up and then kicks the fucking shit out of Asuka before punching the fucking shit out of his face and then dropping down and choking the fuck out of Asuka with a rear naked choke. Asuka, who refuses to tap out, goes to fucking sleep. Takata is thus the winner at one minute and 35 seconds of the second round. Whew, what a fight. So, what would become of our two Pururesu fighters here? Alexander Atsuka would be back for real fighting action at Pride number eight, where he will meet a returning Henzo Gracie. As for Takata, as I mentioned last episode, He'll appear at the 2000 Grand Prix opening round, facing off against Hoist Gracie. That's right, the original Gracie. See you then, Takata, you fuckhead. us to our fifth bout of the evening which sees a returning Akira Soji who stands 5'8", was 194 pounds and was 25 years old at the time. Soji's MMA record at this time was 4-2-4. and four. He's facing off against Larry the Violator Parker who stands... <laughs> that's his actual nickname. <laughs> it's a good nickname. It's, it's, it's a good nickname, I like it. <laughs> The Violator stands 5'11", was 201 pounds, and was 36 years old at the time. Larry's MMA record at this time was 10-3-1. Akira Soji, the workhorse of pride, is back for another go-around, this time drawing regional MMA fighter Larry Parker. But just who is this Larry Parker? Born in Denver, Colorado, Larry has a surprisingly diverse pedigree. Little did anyone know that Larry actually fought Kazushi Sakuraba. Well, maybe fought Sakuraba. <laughs> you see, this fight happened under the Kingdom promotion, which was a pro wrestling federation. This happened in January of 1998. The fight was most likely a work, meaning fake, unbeknownst to Parker, apparently. How, Par wait, wait, wait. How can a fight be fake? unbeknownst to one of the people in it. Don't you need to inform people, hey, this fight's gonna be fake? <laughs> and that's what people say, that Sakuraba versus Kimo, where uh, Kimo beat him by a uh, uh, Kimura, yeah. he said that Sakuraba knew he was supposed to lose, but apparently Kimo didn't know that it was set up. Oh. That's why they claim it was fake, but again, it's still in the official record books. 
And this fight here, Larry Parker versus Sakuraba, you won't find it in the record book, so we're just gonna assume it was fake. Parker made his official MMA debut in March of 1998 at ISC 1998. That's International Super Challenge, a Ukrainian regional promotion. He would win his bout via TKO. He then returned to America and fought in a string of regional events, including Unified Shoot Wrestling Federation, where at USWF number nine, a tournament, he would win twice via submission and then lose in the final bout of the evening to MMA journeyman Paul Buentello via KO. So are those like, those tournaments, are they like multiple fights in one night? Yes. Holy so shit. So it was three fights in one night. Wow, that's a fucking impressive. Larry would later go on to win a USWF event, USWF number 13, which was held on March of 1999 with three straight submissions. Larry also appeared at the Boss Rootin Invitational number four, just a month prior to Pride number seven here, an event that would also see a young Nate Marquardt take on a young Eves Edward. Uh, Nate would win that bout. And as the name suggests, this was some type of MMA tournament event featuring Boss Rutan's name, and it was held in Denver, Colorado of all places. Pre-fight, we get a pretty good glimpse of Larry Parker and all his various tattoos. Quadros calls it very colorful. And hey, I have my own. Who does this fighter look like? <laughs> he looks whoa, like- Whoa, whoa, I am going to sue you for copyright infringement. That's my fucking thing. And when I show the graphic, I'm going to have your name crossed out. <laughs> like <PMDA. laughs> Asshole. He looks, Larry Parker looks like a mashup of George St. Pierre and Steve-O from Jackass fame. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Round number one. Low kick by Parker starts us off, then a missing left punch by him. Soji with a hard low kick. Now, one second, before you keep going with the fight. Yes. Now, th maybe maybe it's me, but, like, does Soji look slightly more out of shape than he usually is? <laughs> yes. You well, know? yeah. Yeah. Like, he... every time, like, for the last, maybe, two prides, every time I see him, he's getting progressively less in shape. And I don't know if it's... Maybe not less in shape, but maybe less wrestling shape, if that makes any sense. Like, yeah. not as much, like, tone, muscles. Definition, yeah. Definition, there you go, but still the same strength and shit. So I would understand that, because it's more beneficial for MMA. But it just it just looks weird, because I'm seeing this son of a bitch every time, just pudgier and pudgier. Yes, he's uh, not looking too great, and he definitely looks like he is not training hard at all. Wow, razor sharp shoot in by Parker and he gets Soji down. Larry is in full guard, then he advances to half guard. Good positioning work by Parker and then suddenly a voice comes out of nowhere and says something very strange. They'll fight for you. Soji on, they'll fight for you. I don't know if either of you guys caught this, but I did, and I had to play it back several times with earphones on to hear it. It doesn't sound like Boss. It's definitely not Quadros. It could sound like Boss, but listeners, I'm gonna play it again for you. Put your earphones on and tell me if you can determine whether this is Satan. They'll fight for you. <laughs> because I, I, what it I'm like. gonna have to go back and I'll listen to it again, and I'll I'll put it once the video comes out. I'll post it in the comments. See if I if see if I heard what what I needed to hear. Punches by Parker. Parker with more rights, and Soji begins to move. Parker gets to mount, and even though a leg inadvertently gets trapped, he's still pretty much in mount. More good punches by Parker, and so far I'm actually really impressed with his top game. Parker postures up and delivers three solid punches. To, as Soji looks to unbalance Parker. Parker gets up to his feet and Soji grabs for an ankle lock, but Parker explodes out of it and falls to his back. Soji, the fat fuck, is breathing hard already as he throws a barely committed leg kick. More kick attempts by Soji on a still downed Parker. Three minutes are down in round one. Good job by Parker avoiding any damage from this position. I'm even more impressed. He's just not some amateur. The ref steps in and stands Parker up, and the crowd applauds. We have yet to see, okay, they're being restarted standing. We have yet to see a person standing up stop a guy from the bottom by kicking him to the legs in that position. Leg kick by Soji as Parker throws a stilted one-two. 
Then another by Soji, and Parker shoots in with another crisp takedown. But Soji is able to sprawl this time, get to his feet, but Parker just keeps pushing, to which Soji can't stop it, and now Soji is down to the mat. Parker appears to get an idea for a leg lock or a knee bar, and Soji pushes him away, getting back to his feet. Parker grabs him around the waist, follows him to the corner, and then gets swung down to the mat. Soji is now on top. Cue Cole Uno in his helium-like voice. Now we finally have Larry Parker on the bottom. And yes, I have been oh able to God. verify yes, son of a bitch. that the high-pitched high coach that's in Soji's corner is Cole Uno, ultra badass MMA fighter. Oh, so he's a... But I mean, every time I hear him, I can't... I can't take this son of a bitch seriously. <laughs> no. it's, it's like... You know, those motherfucking, like, jokes that like, you hear for, like, silent film stars that all of a sudden have the most weird fucking voices. Yeah. This is yeah. right here, right now, man. This is what the fucking point is. I don't care how badass he is. Motherfucking sounds like fucking Felix the Cat. There's light work by Soji, and we're down to five minutes in the round. Parker seems to threaten an arm submission. Soji ejects from his position, and Soji is back to standing. Parker decides to stay on his back. Soji looks to get back inside on Parker and Parker makes him think twice with a quick up kick. The ref steps in again to stand Parker up. There's only light applause from the crowd this time. Done. Oh. Front kick by Parker, then a missing mid kick. This surprises and impresses both Boss and Quadros who comment on it. Wow. Larry Parker has got a lot of tools, boss. Hey, listen, the front kick was a nice front kick. The high kick, he's doing real good. Another kick, and Parker immediately shoots right after. But Soji effortlessly throws him to the side. Soji kicks at the face of a down Parker. And Quadro says it was much like a matador in a bull ring in Mexico. Oh. Oh. That was a beautiful sidestep flip over by Akira Shoji, almost like a matador in a bull ring in Mexico. Only three minutes left in round one and Soji isn't threatening with anything from here. The ref once again comes in and stands Parker up. But I mean, at the very least, Soji has done the Soji way of not getting caught in shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one of those things that previous prides you knew he was good at is he's not gonna get caught on shit and he's he's pulled it off and i mean maybe maybe like i said maybe his shape is different like and maybe he's trying to out stamina the other guy because you know we've seen that before so i don't know maybe I, i'm just giving soji the benefit of the doubt i shouldn't but i'll, I'll let you give him the benefit of the doubt <laughs> but i think he's looking like a fat piece of shit a weird chant begins in the crowd, and as best as I can discern, it consists of only two jack-offs who repeatedly shout, Let's go, Soji! So, breathing heavy, especially when you notice when Parker's on the ground. He didn't attack, he didn't do anything, he was hitting, breathing heavy. So I think they're both maybe, but Larry actually... Let's go, Soji! <laughs> I guess he's got his fans. Well, I mean, he's been in every fucking pride. <laughs> Soji pressures Parker into the ropes, and as he moves in, Parker with a furious nerd rage attack that backs Soji the fuck up. Only one minute left in round one. Soji exaggeratedly steps in to attack Parker, then grabs him around the body with double underhook. Parker appears to simply pull guard, falling very excitedly back to the mat. Soji is in full guard. Light punches by both men, and as Parker seems to be trying to sneak in setting up a leg triangle, Soji decides to counter by falling back for an ankle lock, but he flies right off and loses his grip. The bell then rings, ending round one. There's more weird noises from the commentary. Ooh. Ah, ah, ooh. <laughs> I think one of the audio texts that helped put this DVD together is trolling everybody <laughs> with this weird shit. Round two! It's the girl from the ring, man. <laughs> I'm calling her right now. We just watched this video. Audience, if you don't hear from us in seven days, just know we watched the ring. <laughs> right. The fighters circle at the center of the ring. Soji goes for a kick and more furious nerd strikes from Parker. Wow, fucking scary. <laughs> Leg kick by Parker. Front push kick by Parker, then a low kick by Soji. Whoa, Soji pushes in now and grabs a hold of Parker. And then once again, it appears Parker 
pulls guard. Quadros poses a question for Boss, asking if fighters in Japan fight more for honor or quote unquote the money. Boss provides his jaded opinion on it. Now let me ask you this, Boss. You were a champion in Japan. In your experience of being around fighters around the world, do you think more fighters fight for the honor and recognition or contrarily the money? Okay, that's the real issue. And in the beginning it starts out for the honor and the recognition. <laughs> but then once you get to a certain level and you realize that you've been like on the top of something for like a couple of years and you have to keep training and the same food and the same this as sleeping during the day, then it's a job, it becomes a job, then you want the money. This topic opens up a huge can of worms for Quadros, and it carries on for nearly four minutes. And eventually he asks Boss if fighters lose their fire after they get the money and recognition. <coughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Well, that's not true. Because Takeda has never fucking won a fight, and he still has fire. So clearly, I just proved you wrong. Well, and, and Quadros, Quadros defends Soji here. He's, he uses Soji as an exact opposite of his losing fire. But I say wrong, wrong, wrong. Just look at the shape of him, man. He's nearly stopped giving fucks. I know, but, but here's the thing is, he's not losing. I mean, like, he hasn't lost, I should say. He hasn't lost yet. This this fight he's you know he's not winning but he hasn't been beaten. What what what's his record here? Oh, uh, let's go back. I think it's <laughs> four two and four. That's four wins, two losses, and four draws. Okay, that's no, still, <laughs> that's still what? Ten fights. No, that's a that, that's a two two wins per loss record. That's not bad. <laughs> Light work by both men, but nothing to write home about. This goes on for several minutes. Why am I just noticing this now? Larry Parker has tap out shorts on. This is 1999, folks. Whoever invented tap out shorts was a fucking genius. It's a huge brand now. Tap out. Fucking, you see guys walking around with tap out shirts and everything. Well, I, I, I personally fucking haven't. But then again, I'm not in the, I'm not in those circles. My circles are more fucking wearing Mario. <laughs> tap out is a huge brand, and for it to exist this early in MMA, marketing genius. Oh, where was I? Finally, Soji decides to do something. He lifts Parker up and slams him down. One guy in the crowd claps. We're at the five minute mark of round two and so far a big disappointment with Soji on top. I'm begging the ref to stand us up. Soji postures up, stands on his feet and either he or Parker try for something as Parker spins. Then Soji pushes him to roll. Soji now has Parker's back. Then Larry rolls for a knee bar to which Soji wisely escapes. More smooth moves by Parker, and I'm kind of blown away by him. I mean, he's doing well, but this second round, I'm, I'm seeing Soji, man. I'm, I'm seeing him. I, I, I mean, I know he's not fucking pulling the most imp impressive shit there was, but he's keeping Parker on guard. Mm. Yeah. He landed one serious good punch. Yeah. Soji moves back in and manages to get back into guard. The ref holds the fight to spin Parker away from the ropes. Four minutes left in round two. The crowd laughs at something. Not sure what though, which happens right before a clear shot of Cole Uno. Be every, every sport. That's why I say, okay, Jets Pover then. Because Jets is not a crap letter. It's probably a uh, uh, boss doing shots. <laughs> shots, 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 everybody. <laughs> Soji suddenly pulls away from Parker and paces around him. Parker then returns to his feet. When talking about Cole Uno, Boss Rutan describes him as this. Young guy, you know, mellow, uh, goes out and gets high. <laughs> There's Carl Uno looking on as Soji, who he is cornering, is doing a great job and staying in control so far of this match. Yeah, and if you look at Uno, you will never say he's one of the top fighters in the world. Yeah, he looks pretty mellow. Yeah, young guy, mellow, you know, the guy who goes out, ooh, gets high. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with that son of a bitch? <laughs> Just out him, why don't you, boss? Talk about how he goes out and gets high. 
Soji bursts in with a fury of punches. Parker responds with his own flurry. Soji with a body lock and Parker once again flies back to the mat. Three minutes left in round two. Soji postures up for some strikes, but Parker defends and Soji makes a weird noise that almost sounds like a frog is being crushed. Go straight back. Go straight back. Soji tries to throw down some more strikes, but gets pushed away by Parker. Soji asks Parker to stand the fuck up, and Parker does. <laughs> they trade punches, and Soji clips Parker with a hooking left. What starts off as a low kick by Soji suddenly turns into a mess of fists, with Parker getting pegged with a good right. Parker looks to flee and Soji stays with him. Parker goes low and then falls back to the mat. Soji dives right into fucking guard. Wrong, wrong, wrong. He should have stayed up and had Parker stand up. I mean, at this point, S -S Parker is full out on the defensive. I don't think even if he had let him get back up, it would have made any difference. Mm. Cause I don't think, I think Parker at this point has to some extent tired himself out. Because Soji's just landing much better hits. And and that's the thing, man. I, I, see, I don't see Parker doing anything different. I think he would have tried to stay down on the ground as, as long as he fucking can. Yes, he's obviously getting very tired here. Ah, uh, Soji tries to hammer down fist onto Parker, but his strikes are negated by Parker's defenses. One minute left. Soji pulls away, tells Parker to stand up, and then the ref reiterates it, telling Parker to get his ass up. Clubbing girly strike attempt by Parker. Then he grabs Soji with a body lock. They hit the ropes and Parker pulls guard again. We end the round here with no finish to our fight. We'll go to the judges now to find out our outcome. And it's deemed a draw. Go for Boo. 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 <laughs> Why? But here's the thing. I, I give Parker the first round. Okay. But I give Soji... A much more definitive <laughs> second round. Okay. So overall, I think it should have been Soji. And hands down. I don't know if, if Pride had established their judging parameters here where they judged it on the whole fight and not round by round. I think I they think do round by round. They're which doing is, it round by is, round. Which is, like I said, Soji on the second round, which must which was much more definitively beating Parker than Parker beating Soji in the first round. And if they had it judged by the entire entirety of the fight, then yes, I think you might have been able to give it to Soji. Before our overtime round begins, Larry Parker isn't looking so hot. And then, for some reason, the ref comes over, grabs him by the wrist, and guides him to the center of the ring. Quadros and Boss are both confused by this, unsure of what it means and what is going on. They question whether Parker is actually able to go on. Uh, I wonder if Larry Parker is injured. He seems to be hesitating about coming out. <laughs> Does he look okay to you, boss? No, he does not look okay. It looks like there's a, a, some kind of a problem here. Parker definitely looks like maybe he pulled a muscle or he has injured his ribs. It's eventually Parker sent back to his corner and the fight will go on. Overtime round! Very robotic movement and punches by Parker, leading to a leg kick by Soji, which spins Parker around. Soji follows it up with a barrage of punches. <laughs> this is what happens, Larry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is what happens, Larry. This is what happens, Larry. <laughs> when you fuck a stranger in the ass. You see what happens, Larry? This is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass, Larry. This is what happens, Larry. You see what happens, Larry? You see what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass? <laughs> I, I missed something. I can tell the you. The Big Lebowski? Oh, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> right when he takes me, he spins around, he starts landing bombs on him. He's like, this is what happens, Larry. <laughs> Larry tries to shoot in, but Soji dodges, then makes Parker pay with more punches as Parker is on the mat. Soji backs away, and the ref stands Parker up. Parker moves in clumsily, swinging his fist around like a child, and then he tries to grab Soji, who throws him down. Parker is in the corner and isn't looking good at all. Soji decides to move in and get into Parker's guard, much to Parker's relief. Annoying punches to the head by Soji. And then Soji tries to work more punches, getting a good one in here and there. Quadros thinks the age difference is the cause for the stanima difference, being that Parker is 36 and Soji is only 25. I myself don't think so, but then again, I'm pretty fucking dumb. <laughs> Three minutes left in our fight. 
Soji postures up and delivers some good punches, all the while making exaggerated Japanese grunts. Yeah, yeah. He's getting for the takedown and he slammed him into the corner. Yeah. Listen to Soji talking to Larry Parker. Quadros claims that Soji is talking to Parker. What the fuck? Are you drinking again, Quadros? Uh, what do you mean? Are you drinking again? <laughs> yeah, he's never stopped. That is. That is what I believe. Very slow, soft punches by Parker, and you can stick a fork in him because he's done. He's done! The ref comes in to reposition the fighters. Quadros decides it's a good time to ask Boss his favorite sport. Any guesses on what it is, dear listeners? What is your favorite sport? Uh, yeah, fighting. <laughs> Yeah. Mixed martial arts. Mixed martial arts. Is definitely my favorite sport. Yeah. It just dawned on me. I was, I was trying to see if I like swimming or something, you know, for myself to do, but I really have to think about fighting as the, the coolest thing to do. I thought he was going to say curling myself. <laughs> I have no idea what Quadros' point here is for bringing this up. But one second, before before we bring this up, because when this, you know, extra round kick started, Boss and Quadros were saying that it happened because Soji had not shown dominance mm. in the last round. And then the fucking moment they say that, Soji shows nothing but fucking dominance. <laughs> and I'm like, what other dominance do you want, asshole? <laughs> Soji finally pulls away and stands up. The ref tells that motherfucker Parker to get the fuck up. Kicks exchanged by the fighters. Spinning kick by Larry. As Soji moves in, Parker grabs him and pulls guard. Boss is supremely disappointed. And Quadro says, that's not gonna work here. Oh, but that's not gonna work here. Quadros needs to realize Parker don't give a shit. He's tired or hurt and he just wants to hold the fight here. Light punches by both fighters. Quadro says, I wonder if any jujitsu fighter has hurt their back pulling guard like that. How Parker was flying back to the mat very exaggeratedly. Boss responds and does an impression of what I can only assume is one of the Gracies. I wonder if there's ever been a jujitsu fighter in a big professional fight that pulled guard like that and hurt his back. Because he's, sla he's slamming, he's slamming down for hard. You don't want to do this on the street. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You don't want to do this uh, with, the, with there's a sidewalk up there. It's just it's the best self-defense in the street. Oh yeah, but don't do this. <laughs> Soji gets off of Parker and both he and the ref demand that he stand up. But there's only 30 seconds left in our fight. Parker gets up and delivers a straight kick towards Soji. Soji grabs him and dumps him down to the mat. Then gets into Parker's guard trying to smash his face but he doesn't really do much. Larry just holds on and the bell rings. After the fight, Soji looks disappointed, Parker looks defeated, and we go to the judges. And the decision goes to Akira Soji, a very well-earned decision, a very hard fought battle against a courageous. And it's unanimous, folks. The judges all scored for Soji, who is the winner of our fight. What were your thoughts on this bout, gentlemen? He's busy drinking. I, no, I don't know if they, if they are wary. If he would have, maybe he had some more conditioning or something like that. He just, you see, if he didn't learn it, it just fell apart for him. So, no, here's the thing is, like I said, Soji, me. Soji fucking <laughs> last, lasted the fucking fight, man. Maybe that was his plan all the fuck along. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think at the end he looked he looked you know bad because he saw how out of it Larry was mm. and he just couldn't end it. Yeah. I mean I'd be disappointed if I couldn't end that faster too. In poop striking. I, I, you know what? It it wasn't a terrible fight. There was some good action, lots of laughs throughout with all the weird shit going on. Oh, no fucking shit. I was very surprised by Parker. I had no idea who he was uh, until I did his history. Uh, I was very surprised by him. Five out of ten. I'll give it.
<laughs> oh come on! I'll give it at least uh, at least at least a seven, seven out of ten. So, what would become of our two nerd rage fueled fighters here? Akira Soji would not be back for Pride number eight. Wow, that's right. Soji would be sitting the next Pride out. He would instead fight at the Pancrase 1999 anniversary show. It was held a mere six days after Pride seven here. Six days? Six days. Holy fuck, man! I, I applaud that motherfucker. And then. He he would go on to appear at the opening rounds of the 2000 Grand Prix held on January 30th of 2000. There he'll be fighting a returning Ebenezer Fontes Braga. We'll see you then, Soji. As for Larry Parker, this would be surprisingly his only appearance in Pride. He would only have five more fights in his career following this event, with no real notable events or opponents, unless you consider his next fight, which was a return bout against Paul Buentello, to be notable. He would lose that fight, by the way. He would uh, retire in April of 2001 at the age of 38, ending his professional MMA career with a record of 13 wins and 6 losses. <laughs> sees a returning Kazushi Sakuraba who stands six foot, was 183 pounds, and was 30 years old at the time. Sakuraba's MMA record as of this fight was 5-1 and won with one no contest. He's facing off against newcomer to Pride, Anthony Mad Dog Macias from the USA who stands 5'10", was 175 pounds, and was 28 years old at the time. Macias's MMA record as of this fight was 15-5. We know a lot about Sakuraba, but what about this mad dog guy? Macias was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And if you know nothing about Oklahoma, we're going to give you a little bit of history. Feel, you, feel yourself lucky if you know nothing about Oklahoma. <laughs> Let me tell you this, because I heard about, I heard this joke and I think it's so applicable here. You want to know how boring Oklahoma is? Their slogan is, Oklahoma is okay. <laughs> yes. In fact, for a, little bit, right? <laughs> for a little bit more information on Oklahoma, just have a watch of this clip. So, I just did this whole college tour of Texas and Oklahoma, and let me tell you, if you've never been to Oklahoma, whoo, save your fucking money, because there's no reason to go whatsoever. There's nothing there. It's like a state looking for something to be proud of is what's happening. Their state motto in Oklahoma, I swear to God, they printed right on their license plate, is Oklahoma is okay. <laughs> gotta wonder what their choices were to come up with that piece of shit. We got our five final choices for the Oklahoma state license plate program. Billy Bob, you wanna read them all? <clears throat> we have A, Oklahoma's okay. B, Oklahoma, the circus has been here twice. <laughs> C, Oklahoma, some people say we don't suck. <laughs> D, Oklahoma, trees are made of wood. <laughs> oh, they are, they are. And E, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, there, I said it twice. No, no. 
Macias started his MMA career with a tough task, fighting Dan the Beast Severn at UFC 4 on December 16th of 1994. Dan would choke Mad Dog out at 1 minute and 45 seconds of the first round. And of course in that fight, uh, Macias was giving up roughly 80 pounds. His next fight was at UFC 6 on July 14th of 1995 in Casper, Wyoming, otherwise known as the perfumed armpit of time. <laughs> where, <laughs> where Anthony would beat his opponent, his first opponent of the three fight evening. He-Man Ali Gibson. Yes, that is a real name. He-Man would submit to Anthony's punches in the first round. He means the name of my dick. Because <laughs> I got the power! <laughs> but in his second fight of the evening, it wouldn't go so well, as Oleg Tuktarov would guillotine Mad Dog after only nine seconds Holy of the shit. first round. But if you are to believe Big John McCarthy, this fight was fixed. McCarthy had this to say about it. During the semifinal match between Oleg Tuktarov and Anthony Macias, I believe I saw my first fixed fight in the UFC. Both fighters had the same manager, Buddy Albin, so I think it was decided backstage that Macias would throw the fight so Oleg could advance to the finals and face Tank Abbott as fresh as possible. The fight went a little too smoothly for my taste when Macias shot in and nearly fell into the guillotine choke, which he tapped out in 12 seconds. It was nine seconds, Big John. Nine seconds, <laughs> which technically makes it even fucking worse. If, yes. if it was if it was a setup, fucking nine seconds at least make it believable. Yes. Macias wouldn't have another notable bout unless you consider John Dixon notable until he faced off against Alan Goes, who Sakuraba previously beat and who we would actually get to see a glimpse of later. This was at Extreme Fighting Number no. Three in Tulsa, Oklahoma, on October 16th of 1996. Goez would cause Macias to tap out at three minutes and 52 seconds of the first round via strikes. Some fights after, Macias would lose twice to Soviet journeyman Vladimir Machushenko, a fighter who would have a few notable appearances in the UFC. Macias' last bout before Pride 7 here was over a year prior at Power Ring Warriors in July of 98. I mean, I gotta give these MMA events some <laughs> fucking props. They have some amazing fucking names. Back then they did when there was a whole lot of them. Yes. Yeah, holy shit. Some of these names, I'm like, that sounds awesome. This event was held in parts unknown as they didn't list where it was held. <laughs> but he would defeat... His opponent, Cedric Marks, via guillotine. Okay, just what the hell is up with Sakuraba's intro? Any Japanese fans out there, can you tell us what the hell all those little words were saying that were popular? Probably amazing, fighter, honorable, <laughs> winner. I don't know. That's that's what I'm fucking assuming, man. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> that's what they said. I will say, I will ask this. Is, is his ear permanently fucked now? Yes. Okay, because he's always worn that bandage. Well, he, so his I, other ear is obviously fucked up, but I think the one on the right has a lot of scar tissue, so it just it opens up really okay. easily. I, I just didn't know because you know I they part of his intro they show the you know during the fight that he got injured, mm -hmm. and that was what how long ago that was, was it? Was oh Pride three? Yeah, that was a while ago, yeah. and he's still wearing that bandage, so I don't know if it's. If it just keeps getting injured or just permanently fucking injured. The Japanese crowd needs more coordination and they need to put a little bit more effort in getting it right as it appears they try they are trying to hold up a piecemeal K sign in the crowd. Uh, maybe there's another two Ks that we are seeing. Oh my god. Are you really going with that fucking joke? Really? Maybe, maybe there's another two Ks that we are seeing. Jesus fucking Christ. That's the kind of comedy you came to your see, people. Motherfucking uh, KKK jokes. Better luck next time. Jesus. Macias has a cute little heart tattoo on his chest, and he must be a lover boy. Alright, speaking of, speaking of that, and, and uh, speaking of that, I mean... Somewhat not related. Is Sakuraba the only one that wears bright print shorts? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. everyone else wears white and or black or or, yeah. or something like that. Sakuraba is the only bright ass fucking color I've orange. seen. Orange is his color. He but, likes orange. But style. the ones he wore today, or not today, I should say, for this event, what, those I, were pink. I think they're orange. Were they? I'm, but, am I fucking? I well, think you might. Be I can't be in the air force now. I'm fucking colorblind. One of us is colorblind. <laughs> so, fight fans, you'll have to let us know who's right. Are his shorts pink or are they orange? 
Because I remember they were orange last time. Yeah, it's orange to me, but... It's... Okay, and here we go again. It sounds like Quadro straight up breaks the fourth wall again. In this case, to spoil a surprise move in the fight. And evidently, Sakuraba has got a real tricky new suplex takedown up his sleeve in this fight. There's been a lot of rumor about that. He mentions Sakuraba has a new tricky suplex takedown that he's been working on, and he might just use it in this fight. You motherfucker. I didn't catch that, and that's a fucking asshole move by him. Because I was surprised by that move, I will tell you that. I made a note about it. I'm like, wow, he's using his wrestling background. You motherfucker, <laughs> Quadros. All right, round one. Macias starts us off with a beautiful display of Taekwondo, but they don't do anything. As Sakuraba moves in, Macias sticks him with a front kick slash snap kick, then beans Sakuraba with a left hook. Macias moves forward and just missing with a roundhouse. Quadros is very impressed. Whoa, look at that. Wow. Sakuraba has had enough of this and decides to take it to the ground, securing a double leg and trying to put Masias on the mat. But Masias uses momentum to pull Sakuraba over him. Masias and Sakuraba stand up and Sakuraba has over under body lock. Then he gets a full body lock and muscles the smaller, lighter Masias down to the mat. This to me is proof that Sakuraba felt he is no match for Masias and his kicks which might be the first time since Daniel-san in Karate Kid 2 that a Japanese man has been afraid of a white boy's karate. Palm strikes by Masias. Sakuraba is deciding what to do, working from half guard. Quadros with some history work of his own here, bringing up the common opponent of both men, that being Alan Goa. Both men have a common opponent in Alan Goes, Kazushi Sakuraba, Got away with a draw, whereas Anthony Macias wasn't so lucky, and he lost by a submission he verbally gave up, and that was, that was an extreme fighting number three. Sakuraba gets to side control. Sakuraba attempts to trap Macias' left arm with his legs, but Macias bucks and moves, managing to get Sakuraba in a butterfly guard, then manages to turn Sakuraba and nearly get on top. Sakuraba gets back, though, but eats some punches from Macias. Sakuraba standing over Sakuraba. Well, what the fuck? <laughs> Sakuraba standing over Sakuraba. Way to go, man. I mean, there's a lot of fucking standing. <laughs> Sakuraba standing over Masias, chopping with a leg kick before throwing Masias' legs to the side and getting side control. Three minutes down in round one. Dead silence in the crowd, and wow. I, I said this earlier, but it's not something to hear because you can't hear anything. <laughs> Sakuraba spends a minute maybe thinking of an arm bar, but it never comes. Another minute of thinking and plotting, and we're down to five minutes. And just as that mark comes in the fight, Masias manages to slip out from under Sakuraba and stand, delivering a knee, then slapping left punch. Sakuraba thinks to shoot, but Masias is out of range by now. Some punches and breezy kick by Sakuraba. Late kick by Masias. I will say this, Masias has really good fucking kicks. He, that can't be fucking denied. No, his his taekwondo. Like, it, 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 and that's the thing is, all his all his kicks are are really fucking like straight out, like no no slack movement or whatever. It just they, he goes straight for him, and it's it's a fucking present. Oh, I did. Oh, you all right, dude? Yeah. yeah. I'm about I might fall asleep. Oh, fucking Jesus! I've been drinking since noon. Fuck. <laughs> well, better... Keep drinking and stay awake, man. Yeah. <laughs> you fucking better hurry than you. Right. Goofy voices by Boss. Why, Boss? Why? But that's his history. I'm not. I'm well, here. He's not. Four big punches by Sakuraba. Sakuraba gets inside and Masias. Masias? Yes. 
I've been saying Masius the whole time. I, I know. I won't correct you. It's he, funnier that he's way. Not a, he's not that good of a fighter. He don't give a shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? I was going to say this at the beginning and for, fucking forgot. But he, he, he might not be the best. But when you give out 80 fucking pounds to Dan the Man Severin... That that takes balls. Oh yeah, that absolutely. fucking takes yeah, I balls. I wouldn't fight that fight. I wouldn't yeah. fight seven out of the fucking same weight category. Yeah. <laughs> I would have fought him a couple years ago when he was down to dream weight. <laughs> Macias definitely has a lot of guts. Uh, four big punches by Sakuraba. Sakuraba gets inside on Macias and delivers a few more strikes. Macias backs away and Sakuraba follows, pummeling him more, whipping uppercut. Wow, sweet spinning back fist disguised by a left, then a roundhouse that follows by Macias. Impressive techniques from him. Sakuraba lunges in for a punch, then grabs Macias in a body lock, followed by a falling back toss to the mat. Quadros exclaims, that was a suplex! Was that it? Heel kick. Oh! There was that suplex. Was that it? That was a really nice suplex. Though. It was. It was beautiful. Like I, like I said, I put a note down. I'm like, fucking wrestling history right here. You know, background. That's how you fucking apply it. <laughs> Sakuraba is in side control. Macias looks to escape, but Sakuraba stays with him, getting a front headlock position. Then Macias pulls guard. As this is happening, the crowd is very exuberant, and some jack-off in the crowd howls. Boss calls it a werewolf. Listen to that, that sound of the crowd. It's not like yeah, a dog howling. Uh, it's the werewolf. I call it a drunk. <laughs> Double palm smashes by Sakuraba, then a barrage of punches, followed by an attempt to turn Macias for an ankle lock. More punches from Sakuraba, and we're down to three minutes left. Macias manages to get Sakuraba locked down in full guard before Sakuraba loosens it and throws two punches. Up kick by Macias. Slicing leg kick by Sakuraba. Sakuraba teases a leaping attack, then commits to it as he moves back to get ahead of steam on it. And then, a flying side kick that clobbers Macias. The crowd absolutely loves it. But Macias looks okay. Oh, here he goes. <laughs> He's gonna jump. Oh! <laughs> Sliding side kick. <laughs> look, Macias, look. Sakuraba is standing over him, then gets into Macias' guard. Some guy shouts something, eliciting laughs from the crowd, and I wish we had a translator to tell us what these fuckers in the crowd are saying. <laughs> Macias decides to elbow his own thighs, making himself and Sakuraba laugh. One minute left in round one. Macias keeps up the tomfoolery, teasing a straight armbar before letting it go. Quadros says Macias is having too much fun here, and I agree. He better get serious. Sakuraba gets to his feet, and Macias shakes his head, smiling. Sakuraba thinks to do something, but he better hurry as only 30 seconds remain. Sakuraba then grabs Macias' foot and spins him around in comical fashion, much like a Benny Hill scene. The crowd... Absolutely loves it. Oh! <laughs> Gonna make him dizzy. Sakuraba then jumps into the air for a double foot stomp and receives a Macias foot right in his dick package for his <laughs> efforts. To which Quadro says, look at the defense there, straight out of Enter the Dragon. And Rutan replies, right to the pills. Gonna make him dizzy. Ooh, look at the defense there. That was straight out of Enter the Dragon, Bob Wall versus Bruce Lee. Yeah, right to the pills. Oh, oh yeah, wow. And then the bell rings, signaling the end of round one. In between rounds, Quadros says he loved the first round and he praises Sakuraba, as does Boss. Sakuraba definitely looks like the fresher of the two. Round two! Sakuraba opens the round with a spinning back kick, just as Quadros was talking about it. Hmm, coincidence? <laughs> The men clinch, then Macias manages to transition to Sakuraba's back. 
Then Macias decides to leap onto Sakuraba's back. Sakuraba dumps him, then goes for an arm bar. Macias rolls with him, then escapes before delivering a few strikes. Then he takes Sakuraba's back. Sakuraba rolls, managing to get a single leg, and then he puts Macias onto his ass. Overall, a very nice sequence there. Sakuraba advances the side control, then plots his next move. Macias traps his own arm in between Sakuraba's legs. Whoops. Sakuraba starts to set up an arm bar, extending Macias' left arm over his chest, then falling back. Macias tries to hold on, getting his legs up to help. Then he turns to his stomach and stands, but Sakuraba still has the arm, and blind to us, he taps out right here. Sakuraba is the winner at 2 minutes and 30 seconds of the second round. And it almost, for a second, for a second, it looked like Macias wasn't, like, was gonna argue that he didn't tap. It almost seemed like way. Mm -hmm. And then he came up to Sakuraba, and then he bowed down, yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's that's pretty good. That's, uh, you know. Terrible camera angle. We didn't get to see it. And a lot of the replays don't help. Sakuraba is then awarded the wimpiest trophy I have ever seen. And it really is an embarrassment to even give somebody <laughs> on a major fight card. If you're going to give out trophies, you don't give that. It's a participation <laughs> trophy, sir. <laughs> oh, and though we initially miss it, uh, Sakuraba and Matsui roughhouse around in the ring while a replay is going on. And then the camera cuts to show that what is going on. Sakuraba then gets on the mic, says words in Japanese, then exits the ring. You would think by now, honestly, this pisses me off. Because you would think by now these DVDs that are getting fucking released for the rest of the audience... Because fuck, Japan saw these events live. You would think they would fucking put translations by yeah, now. Yeah, words or something on like that. something. Jesus fucking Christ! As Sakuraba exits the ring, he has a meeting with a blonde Alan Goes. Quadro says Alan might be asking for a rematch. Huh? What were you guys' thoughts on this fight? Shane, uh, impressive as usual. Sakuraba came out. And it's really nice shots. I love the sliding kick where you back because you you think he's gonna jump in the air and do the stomp, but mm -hmm. yeah, impressed as usual. I will say Sakuraba was yeah amazing. Uh, I like I said at the beginning I was really imp impressed with uh, Masia's uh, kicks, but he he just didn't hold a candle to Sakuraba. Sakuraba was pulling off every move he knew like. Hammer hits, you know, mm -hmm. those were really good. Really nice uh, when, too, yeah. when when Macias was on the ground and and Sakuraba made it look like he was gonna do his his patented like jumping kick and instead slid in and kicked him, yeah. you know, fucking that's impressive. That shit, that shit flies. That's why I love this son of a bitch. Yeah, excellent fight. I thought Macias looked good. Uh, Sakuraba looked great, and it was fun throughout. Yeah. So, what would become of our two elastic fighters here? Sakuraba would return to action at Pride 8, where he'll face off against Hoyler Gracie. As for Anthony Macias, he would return for just one more Pride, which would be, any guesses? Grand Prix. Pride the Best, Volume 1, uh -huh. <laughs> way ahead in February of 2002. There he'll face off against... Aiji Mitsuoka. And at this point, I cannot wait until we get to that event. It will be like an April Fool's joke. It seriously is one of the best, worst MMA events of all time. As previously covered here on Pride Resurrection, here are some of the returning faces for this The Best Volume 1. Piece of shit Daiju Takase, <laughs> who beat Manny Yarbrough at Pride 3. Amir Ranavardi, loser to Gary Goodridge in Pride 3. Soichi the Monster Nishida, loser to Ensign Inoue at Pride 5. And now Anthony Macias, loser here at Pride 6. But wait, there's more! Joe San, future convicted rapist and prison murderer, <laughs> serving life, will fight at this uh, event. Obviously, before he was arrested, no fucking shit. <laughs> so clearly, this is the uh, this is Pride, the best of not winners. <laughs> <laughs> and spoilers, Josan might also appear at Pride, the best volume two. I'm not fucking shitting you. He was so good at volume one, they called him right. back for volume two. It, he had his own fight style called Josan Doe, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> he really did. Yes, he did. Oh, Absolutely. Oh, oh, oh. Gang raping someone. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, oh yes, definitely. It's going to be such a good, amazingly bad event because there's other no names. It has not a single headlining name on the whole card. Pure fucking shit. I can't wait. And that takes us to our final bout of the evening, which is a returning Igor Volchanchkin, who stands 5'8", was 235 pounds, and was 26 years old at the time. Igor's MMA record as of this fight was 41-2. and two. He's facing off against a returning Mark Kerr, who stands 6'3", was 255 pounds, and was 30 years old at the time. Kerr's MMA record, meanwhile, was 11-0. and zero. Both men are coming off wins at Pride 6, with Kerr returning after an odd yet decisive victory over Takata, and Igor returning after a decisive decision over Carlos Barreto. These men are coming into the contest as the number one and number two ranked heavyweights in the world at the time, with Kerr being number one, and they are set out to see who is the best at man punching. I will say this. this the moment I saw this matchup, I'm like, this is what fucking a Rocky movie should be like. You know, fucking yeah. badass fucking American, badass fucking Russian. Yes. Goddamn <laughs> right, man. Add some fucking, like, big titty woman. Oh, <laughs> perfect fucking movie. Pre-fight, Quadras calls this a true clash of giants in the sport. And yes, this is an epic showdown. Quadros also questions the level of opponents Mark Kerr has had. If you look at their opponents and the level and caliber of their opponents. Uh, Kerr beat Takata in his last fight, whereas Bochanski beat Carlos Barreto in his last fight. And down the line like that, Bochanski may have faced a tougher caliber opponent than Kerr has. Yeah, that's what more people say, but yeah. But Oz tries to defend Kerr though, but really comes up short. Round one! Kerr starts us off with a left jab, then a half-hearted leg kick before he moves in with a push kick. They clinch, and Igor swings with a right. The two muscle each other around the ring, then Igor with a short right as they break momentarily. Kerr moves in with a missing right, then clinch again. Quadro somehow spots that the fighters clashed heads. I didn't see it, but the blood on Igor's head says yes they did. Kerr sends up a knee that slightly connects and they break. Body kick by Kerr, but Igor catches it and sends Kerr down with a swinging right. Kerr gets up and the crowd so far is loving this action. It's a monumental battle here. Looks like Igor is doing some pretty good work in the, in the clinch here. Shopping right hand there by Bochanchin. Beautiful. And it looks like they might have clashed heads a little bit in there in the clinch. Good knee. And Kerr with the overhook and the Whoa. twist down. Big Whoa. right hand by Bo Chanson. He caught that kick by Kerr. Big shoot in by Kerr and he takes Igor all the way across the ring to the ropes and moves Igor down to the mat. Kerr is right in front of his corner and Mark Coleman shouts instructions at Kerr. Kerr is in full guard and Igor is breathing hard. Kerr's, Kerr's breathing even fucking harder. Kerr has had good hits, but you know what? I never thought I'd see a fight where Kerr didn't want to trade blow for blow. Yeah. Let's be honest because you know what? He, he gassed himself out. 
really fucking badly. Slow work at this moment by Kerr. Body shot by Kerr, then a short left by Igor. Three looping punches by Kerr, then Igor pushes Kerr off with his feet. Kerr pushes Igor's feet to the side and comes down with a right, then he's back in full guard. Coleman asks for Kerr to work on Igor's cut. Work on that cut. Yeah, he has to. We worked hard on it. Boss states that Kerr didn't train with him for this fight. At this time, Kerr had moved over to Hammer House with Coleman. Boss later states that it was because Boss didn't have enough time to train with Kerr and that the scheduling was difficult, leading Kerr to leave. There's a few punches from the bottom by Igor and a few from Kerr on top. Rapid fire lefts and rights from Igor and Kerr responds with his own flurry. We're down four minutes in round one. Kerr is now standing and a big axe kick stomp by Kerr to the body, which Kerr uses to fall down on top of Igor, who scrambles. Igor rolls to his stomach and a big right hand by Kerr in the forward position. Igor gets to his knees and the men trade punches as Igor stands. Big overhand right by Igor and Kerr looks a bit dazed. Then a looping hook overhand by Igor that cracks Cracks Kerr. And Coleman yelling. There was an axe kick by Mark Kerr. And now Kerr coming up with a good right uppercut. Both Chancellor oh. a big bomb. A big right hand by both Chancellor. A big bomb, says Quadros, but Kerr looks to be okay. They clinch briefly. There's a body shot by Igor, and then they separate. Very lethargic left and right by Igor, and Kerr drops down for a double leg takedown. Igor doesn't even try to defend it, and instead, he just goes to the mat. Kerr is in full guard as Coleman shouts, Suck it up! Kerr, sh Kerr shooting in again. Wow, that right hand, that landed Ooh. right on the temple. It's amazing. Suck it up! <laughs> I love those shots, man. But it's like, every time you see Kerr go to the ground, you can see him just lay on top of Igor. He's, yeah. he's fucking out, he's, he's fucking out. Tired. I'm like, at this point, I honestly made a note, I'm like, Kerr's not winning this fight, and if Kerr does, I'm eating my fucking shorts. Kerr would describe <laughs> it as, as having the heart of a hamster at this time, too. And, and it's, and you can fucking, well, I mean, I didn't know about the steroids thing and stuff like that, but you can fucking see he has no stamina. We're down to five minutes in round one. Light punches by Igor. Quadros thinks whoever wins this fight should be the number one in the sport, and mentions that a lot of people were ranking Kerr number one. Potential spoiler by Boss as Coleman is mentioned to be in the top 10. Boss says, uh, I feel like he's working on a comeback. A lot of people rank Kerr number one and both Chanchen a very close number two. There are a number of, of other fighters floating around in the top 10, Pedro Hizo, Randy Couture, Mark Coleman can never be counted out, even though he's coming off that loss to Takata. Yeah. But he, he, he's working on a comeback, I feel. On a comeback. <laughs> Small exchanges by both men. We're down to three minutes in round one, and we're still here with little action. There's two rights by Kerr. Quadros and Boss discuss fight matchups, with Quadros wondering if Barreto had won against Igor last Pride, would he be here fighting Kerr? Probably not. Kerr postures up and swings with a left and right, then Igor pushes him away. But Kerr wraps up Igor's left ankle, potentially setting something up. Quadros and Boss are suspect at the attempt, but Kerr actually begins to apply good pressure in a sort of upside down heel hook. Then Kerr loses position and goes back into guard, repeating left punches by Igor that are more annoying to Kerr than damaging. Thus, Kerr suddenly gets fucking pissed off, postures up and starts hammering down onto Igor before getting pushed away. Kerr stands over Igor, then goes back into guard. Igor goes back to those left punches and we're down to one minute. Igor keeps up with the punches and we're down to the last 30 seconds. Still, this goes on until the bell rings. End of round one. Great replay of the big punch by Igor during the round with Quadros saying, right on the dome. Quadros is surprised that it didn't knock Kerr out. Me too. It was a really good punch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it buckled him moment. You know what I mean? You could see his knees for a second yeah. sort of shaking. Mark Kerr's wife is apparently in his corner. At least that's what's mentioned by Quadros and Boss. Then over in Igor's corner, there's some old fucking hag, who I am hoping is not Igor's wife. <laughs> and 
It's not. It turns out to be Eugenia, his manager and the person who also was responsible for getting Igor into kickboxing. Round two! Kerr shoots in, Igor tries to sprawl, but Kerr sucks him up and gets him onto his back. Igor really wants to give Kerr cauliflower ear on his left ear as he picks away at it. Kerr postures up to deliver a strike and Igor kicks him off. Kerr looks a bit stunned on his laurels, then shoots in into the ropes in a big lift and takedown. Boss says that Kerr looked tired and had no reflexes. Oh, he's going to be cornering him from... Okay, now they hustle back up. Igor used the heels on hips and got Kerr off of him on his own without a restart. And, and Mark looked tired when he fell backwards. I'm not sure if it's from being tired or maybe something else. Body work by Kerr is Igor pops away at Kerr's left ear. Fighter stamina is talked about, making a point that Kerr's body type gets tired quicker. I, I find that ironic sometimes that people with, nice. with uh, somebody with the build of Mark Kerr, this perfect body, gets tired where somebody like Bo Chanson, who traditionally may look like he's quote, out of shape, unquote, doesn't get tired. Yeah. So stamina, is not what the body looks like on the outside, it's what's inside. Yeah. Igor keeps up with the baby punches, then Kerr postures up. Igor pushes him away, then Kerr gets back into guard. Rinse and repeat. Igor with punches, then Kerr tries to smash him. Kerr is at the end of Igor's feet, and this time Igor tries an up kick or two. Kerr is on his feet. He has Igor's left ankle hook. Igor punches up at Kerr, then Kerr comes down with his own. Kerr lays on top again, more of the same, and we're now down four minutes in the round. Kerr raises up to deliver some heavy blows and once again gets kicked away by Igor. Kerr doesn't really respond as he just falls back to the mat, but Igor does, getting to his feet. Kerr sits on the mat, Igor rushes him, there's a good uppercut by Igor, then he secures a forward headlock and delivers a knee, then another. The ref taps Igor's thigh to warn Igor, but Igor delivers another knee and Kerr looks knocked out. Igor pulls away and begins to celebrate before the ref is even called the fight. Like a lot of celebration, like holy fuck. Yeah. The ref stands and goes into his pocket, his back pocket for what I assume is a yellow card, but no matter to Igor who celebrates wildly, regardless as the bell rings and a graphic suddenly appears saying winner for Igor. It looks like Igor wins. Kerr rises goes to the ref and Igor comes over to hug him and give him a sweet little kiss. Kerr is focused on the ref saying foul, foul, foul. By Bo Chanson, Whoa, a big knee by Bo Chanson. And up, double underhooks there by Bo Chanson. Bo Chanson grinding away and a knee to the top of the head. Another knee to the top of the head. And Kerr is out. Oh my God. Kerr has been knocked out by Igor Bo Chanson. Double knees, but, but wait. Bob Chanson, wild in celebration. He slayed the beast. Whoa, what a surprise. And here they meet in the center of the ring. They hug Bob Chanson. And the referee uh, saying, no knees to the head when you're on all fours. Oh, he and said, he, is he, right. said, he said foul. He said foul. Oh, you know what it was? I think it was a foul. There are yeah, no knees allowed in the ground. He's in all force. That's right. That's right. There are no knees allowed to the head when an opponent is on. But but was he knocked out or was he was he faking to get sympathy? I I don't know. And look, he was. If he was knocked out, he recovered real fast. It was maybe a trick also because he knew it wasn't illegal. This is the problem with Pride at this point. Their rule set was evolving and changing with every new event. And at this point in time in Pride, specifically for this event, knees to the head of an opponent on all fours were illegal, despite the fact that they would be quickly reinstated for the next event. And it's ironic that Kerr was defeated this way because those types of knees were one of Kerr's key weapons in his early fights. And if you believe Boss Rutten, as said in the Smashing Machine documentary, because those knees were so effective for Kerr, tournament officials would move to disallow them to have Kerr's fights last longer. Anyway, Igor gets a trophy as Quadros and Boss debate whether Kerr was faking being knocked out. Cause of so, but let me ask you this. 
Because the, are knees illegal on all four or when the opponent's on the ground? Because to me, there's a fucking difference. When the opponent is on the ground facing down and has four limbs touching the mat, they were, for this fight, oh. illegal. Because, I mean, for me, for me, Kerr was still, like, holding himself up, so I didn't but think that... But he still had limbs, all yeah. four limbs. Yeah, well, I understand that, but I didn't think of him on the ground. I think he was still, like, propping himself up, is yeah. what I was saying. Boss and Quadros debate whether Kerr was faking being knocked out because he knew the knees were illegal. I think he was. I agree with him. The ref then raises Igor's arm. Igor is thus declared the winner at 4 minutes and 36 seconds of the second round. Gentlemen, what were your thoughts on this fight? I think that uh, since when Igor started celebrating, it's like he, he said he was reaching into his pocket, like making it. It's like they didn't want to. Start, they didn't want to be embarrassed by like saying that you exactly. fucking disqualified. Exactly. They didn't want. They're like, uh oh, he's already celebrating. Do we get in here and stop the celebration and tell him that uh, he's disqualified? I will say this: I if the knees are illegal, which clearly apparently they are, then yes, he, they should not have actually given him the shitty trophy because once again they gave him the fucking shitty trophy. Yes. But. At the same time, I don't think Kerr was gonna win this match, regardless of how it ended. Uh, I don't. I, I think Igor would have won. So yes, was it unfair that he ended the match this way? Yes. Would it not? Would it? Is it unfair that Igor won? No, because Igor, I, I am one hundred percent sure would have fucking won. Uh, I thought it was an okay fight, though it's kind of bittersweet for me because it's kind of hard to watch Kerr at this point because he's on his downward slide now. If he would have fought Igor Volchanskin when he first came into Pride... Uh, oh, no, no, no. It would have been an amazing fucking fight. It would have been amazing. It but, and that's the thing is, for this fight, like you said, it had a lot of potential. But the potential ended five minutes into the first round. Yes. Because the first, first five minutes was amazing, you know? Fucking trading blows, trading everything. You, the two fighters giving it them all. And then Kerr ran out of fucking steam. Yeah. So Igor's our winner, correct? No! While the fight ended on a bit of a strange note, it was after the fight that a decision would be declared. It was changed from a win for Igor to a no decision based on the illegal knees. I applaud that. I applaud that. This... Wouldn't be a problem in the future, as immediately following this fight and this outcome, Pride officials, like I said earlier, would quickly reinstate knees to a downed opponent's head. So, what would become of our two top heavyweights here? While Mark Kerr would take a break from Pride, Igor would return for Pride 8, where he'll face off against a returning Francisco Bueno, who we last saw at Pride 5, where he beat up Satoshi Hamna. As for Kerr, he would return for the opening rounds of the 2000 Grand Prix, where he will face off against Ensign Inoue. We'll see you then, Kerr. And that brings us to the end of Pride number 7, and now it's time that we select the fight of the night. Machine, what was your fight of the night? Oh, my favorite one that I watched was the Sakuraba one. I agree, 100 fucking percent, man. I fucking love Sakuraba, <laughs> my favorite. I will say this, Sakuraba is my favorite fighter. Igor is my favorite non-Japanese fighter. <laughs> okay. Well, it's unanimous because this was easy. It was the Sakuraba versus Macias fight. Uh, I thought Macias looked good. Uh, Sakuraba looked amazing. It was, uh, I thought for a while there, you know, Macias, I thought he might have been able to pull something off, but... And, and, and he could have. I mean, that's the thing. It's, well, he, he, had, he had a chance. Yeah. He had a chance. It's just that, honestly, Sakuraba came out working so fucking hard you know you can tell that he's he's been working on his strategy he's been working on on, on workarounds to so that people don't find him predictable and and it fucking works and and i i honestly can i you know it's one of those things where calling to contrast with fucking uh soji thank you <laughs> I, I did i couldn't think of his fucking say, name uh, however long it takes you to find it i'll explain no, it down. <laughs> no. and that's the thing is you know in contrast with soji you know, Soji is letting himself fucking go. He's still winning somehow. Yeah. Fuck him. But Sakuraba's coming in and just being like fucking working for his shit. And I'm, I'm impressed. Always have been. And that brings us to the end of our episode. Wow, what a show. This one was the best yet. <laughs> Not one to sit back on our own morals. We'll be back in short order to cover Pride number eight. And then, hooray, we will be done with the first era of Pride and onto the Grand Prix. But before we get too excited, 
What does Pride 8 have in store for us? Besides the aforementioned bouts of fighters returning for Pride 7, we'll also get a slew of newcomers. Twinkle Toes Frank Trigg will make his debut, facing off against Brazilian Fabiano Iha. Mark Coleman also makes a surprise return, facing off against Brazilian Ricardo Moraes. And besides them, of course, we'll also get to see, as mentioned earlier, Matsui versus Vanderlei, Malenko versus Goes, Goodridge versus Erickson, Igor versus Bueno, Atska versus Henzo, and Sakuraba versus Hoyler. That that honestly, that seems like a great card. It does look because, like a fucking great card. You know, if you had told me that card, let's say about Pride Three. I would have been like, fucking Matsui? Are, are we fucking shitting me on this one? But then we saw Matsui's last fight, and and, and I, I hope good things for him. Absolutely. I hope really do. Absolutely. I think Matsui's uh, rising big time. Soji's going down. Uh, I think they just have different work ethic, yeah. and it's showing. So it looks like a great card. Uh, we're going to get to that really quickly, but for now, we must bid you adieu, listeners. So for the Colombian good vibe. Woo! And the machine, I am the most dangerous man alive today. I wish you goodbye, good luck, and... I'll sniff you fucking jerks later.